Good morning. I know we have a sparse crowd, but that will change. I'm sure people will come filtering in, but you have to respect your time. My name is Roland Anglin. I'm the dean of the college here at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs. Welcome to Managing the City, honoring the career of Professor Sylvester Murray. Sai, as we all know him, is a wonderful teacher and mentor. He spent 18 years at the college and is widely known for his work on management effectiveness, leadership development, and equity and inclusion, all focused on cities and municipalities. Sai is the ultimate scholar practitioner, having served in numerous communities as city manager, including Ann Arbor, Cincinnati, San Diego, and now I just discovered in my home state of New Jersey in Camden. He has been the president of the ICMA, the International City Managers Association, the American Society for Public Administration, and he's been elected to the National Academy of Public Administration. But that's just a few of his accomplishments. He's participated in so many national panels and commissions over the years that it would take the morning to recount them. So I would refer you to the brochure for a flavor of just how accomplished Sai is. You know, the college wanted to honor Sai because he was instrumental in building one of the best city management programs in the country, right here at this college. And for that, we will always be grateful. But Sai's career spanned a period of great change in the study and practice of city management. And we thought that honoring Sai would be a great opportunity to have a discussion on the past, the present, and the future of city management from the vantage point of practice, teaching, and scholarship. Now, we don't pretend that this is an exhaustive treatment of the issues and the trends, but we just believe this taste is important to lead to a continuing dialogue in the college and with our college colleagues in the world of practice. So we ask you to sit back, and enjoy the conversation, and in, we know that with Sai aboard, it's going to be very engaging. We want to thank our co-sponsors, the local chapter of the National Forum of Black Public Administrators, the student chapter of the International City Managers Association, the Ohio APA, and the Cuyahoga County Managers Mayors and City Managers Association. And I can't forget the live-in team, Erin Vokes, Mary Smith, Rachel Singer, Bob Martell, who made this all happen. So we're going to start the conversation with Sai. And to join me in um, having the conversation, we have Susan Gooden who is the Interim Dean and Professor at the L. Douglas Wyler School of Government and Public Affairs, Virginia Commonwealth University, and a dear friend. Thank you, Susan, for doing this. So I'm just going to transition and start the conversation with Sai. Susan, maybe you uh, should ask the first sure. question. Sai, uh, we wanted to, the purpose of this session, we want the audience to have an opportunity to get to know you better and a lot of the things that have shaped your, your thinking and insights. And I think the first place to start is in the beginning. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, where you were born, any personal um, experiences that shaped you um, as a young man into your professional career? I think that I, uh I mentioned it last night, or at least it was, I read it someplace last night, but I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. And <clears throat> high school in Miami, Florida until I was 18 years old. And my father and mother were both born and raised in Georgia. My father had a third grade education when he left Georgia and came to Miami. He and my mother had six children, and his statement to all six of us, I was the last of the six, so I'm telling you what I think he said to the first five. <laughs> uh, but he told us that uh, the most important thing you can do 
is to uh, go to college, finish high school and go to college. And when we were growing up, in those days, we could go to a movie, buy popcorn, and a soda for something like 15 or 20 cents, 25 cents when you do the, uh, the completeness. And I used to go to my father and ask him for a quarter to go to the movies on Saturdays, and he would say to me, I'm saving that money for your education. If you need a quarter, go out and get some bottles, sell bottles, and we used to get two cents deposit on every bottle, and use that money to go to the movies. Well, he was true to his word. He didn't give us any extra money. If we wanted to do something, we had to work or find the money. And when the oldest child finished high school, he asked her which college did she want to go to, and she told him that she wanted to get married, and she was not going to college. And he told her, okay, get married. But he refused to pay for the marriage. The second one was a young man, and he didn't even finish high school. And when my dad, you know, convinced, tried to tell him to finish, he said no because he was a singer, and he could sing the blues. And this was back in the late 40s and the 50s. And blues was a big thing. It was sort of like rap today. <laughs> and uh, my dad said, okay. So he quit school and started singing the blues, and, and that didn't work out. And then uh, he... Uh, came back to my daddy and he wanted to come back and, and pick up my daddy said no, you go out and sing the blues. So he was gone. At that point the third child went to college. And the fourth child went to college. The fifth child went to college. And I was the sixth child who went to college. And again he would, and when I, a long story but I, I'm no. not going to say it a whole lot of it. Does. I never forget, when we were going to college, he sat down. We had to tell him what school we were going to and how much it cost. And he depended on us totally. He, he was not, did not know how to read or write that well. And we would sit around the table, and because I can select whatever college I wanted to, he said, select wherever you go, you want to go, two requirements. You got to stay at that school for four years until you finish. And you cannot come back home because you failed. You've got to get passing grades. And uh, I was tired of Miami. And since he gave me the choice, I selected to go to college in Pennsylvania. It was the furthest away school that offered me some scholarship money. So I passed up the opportunity to go to Florida A&M University, which is where everybody was supposed to go, especially if you I played football, I played in the band. I played in the band. Uh, what instrument? I played the trombone. <laughs> Let me tell you, see that she's making me do this. So I played the trombone because in high school, I wanted to uh, play basketball. And they used to go out for tryouts. We go out for tryouts. We, all of us, you know, people sit on the, in the gymnasium and... Uh, Coach let you, you know, go out and dribble and shoot. And the girls were all in the stands. And uh, I, you know, so I, I, I wanted to go out and try it. And I went out to try for basketball. And when I finished my tryout, the coach said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm 77 years old. And i never forget this. He said, Murray, why don't you take off a year, go play hopscotch, and get your feet together. <laughs> Some of you guys don't even know what hopscotch was. <laughs> but but it, was a, it was a girl's game. I was totally embarrassed. So I left, but I still wanted to be out front. I've always wanted to be out front. So I went to join the band. And the instrument I chose was the trombone. Why do you choose the trombone? 
It's the first line in the band. Trombone is the big one like that. <laughs> and if you are the best one trombone player, and I was, then you actually came out first. So the drummers, you know, every football game, the drummers would come out, boom, 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 boom. And then the band comes up. And that was Murray, first man out. <laughs> and the girls all said, Murray, 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 Murray. <laughs> That's how I started. <laughs> I got to, so I told my dad, I want to go to college. Go where you want to go. Got to spend your money. Spend my money. We sit around the table. He said, how much it costs? I know you're not going to believe this. Tuition was $200. <laughs> back that far back. And uh, I told him, well, it's 200 for tuition, so much room and board. And he said, I stop. I was about to tell him about spending money. <laughs> he said, stop. I'll pay tuition, room and board. If you need anything else, then you pay for it. OK? He counted out the money. He grew up in a depression. He lost money in the banks. So he kept all of his cash in cash uh, under the bed or someplace. But he'd sit out there and just count out the $300, whatever it was. And he gave it to me. He bought me a money belt. Has anybody ever seen a money belt? It's a belt that comes around here. And you put cash in it. And as he was counting out the money, my mom said, buddy, what are you doing? He said, I'm giving this boy some money to go to college. He said, you can't give him that cash money. Suppose somebody knock him in the head. My daddy said, then he won't go to college. <laughs> <laughs> I went to college, took my money belt, and you started off in August. But in November, when it was time to uh, get off for Thanksgiving and go visit, not come back home, but go visit, I uh, wrote my dad again and told him he now owed me the second part of the tuition. So he gave me another $200. And my friends were saying, wait a minute, why are you going to tell your daddy that you got to pay tuition twice? It's supposed to be once easy. I said, because that's what he understands. He understands two means twice. So for the four years I was in college, he paid two tuitions every semester. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> well, I can see financial management was your skill. Yeah, from the beginning. <laughs> from the beginning. So I want to fast forward a little bit, and I happened to, uh, in doing research for this panel, I contacted Bill Shields at ASPA, at the American Society for Public Administration, and I said, when did Cy become a member of ASPA? And he said, January the 1st, 1964 and you've been a <laughs> member ever since and I know you served as president of ASPA in 1986 the second African-American to be president uh, Phil Rutledge being the, the first so can you tell us about ASPA why did you get involved with ASPA what encouraged you to join and what was ASPA like then what were some of the things you got involved in and what do you see as some of your biggest contributions to that? I went to college at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. As the dean said last night, the uh, a member of the Board of Trustees was the director and the dean of the governmental administration program at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. <coughs> and when I was in college, and in my 11th, in my fourth, third year, I became editor-in-chief of the college newspaper. Not because I was an English major, but because the, uh, the professor in charge of it was an English teacher, and he announced to all of us that we were not going to have a uh, college newspaper because nobody 
agreed to be an editor. And, and I started thinking. And I went up to him and told him, I'll be, I'll be the editor. He said, well, we don't have juniors editors. We, our editor should be a senior student. I told him, but you don't have a senior who has applied, so I'm telling you that I will do it. And he said, well, okay. And he said, but you need a team. And we have nobody taking the journalism class. So I went out my third year, got all of my fraternity brothers to sign up for the journalism class. What fraternity was this? Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> and uh, the guys just said, wait a minute, sorry, we don't, we, don't, we don't do journalism. I told them, you're going to do journalism this time. And, and you, all you got to do is come to the class. I'll make certain that everybody passes. And you have to, as editor, I would then select people to be whatever they want to be. Well, this was a time when we went to a black school, Lincoln was a black school, and we had a white president. And that was my, that was my end. And I wrote editorials on each edition why is a white president sitting here at a black school? And a um, white president called me into his office and asked what was my problem. And I told him, uh, I don't have a problem. I think you are our problem, I said this to the president. <laughs> and uh, he said, what did I do? What did I do, Mr. Murray? What have I done? I said, nothing, you're white. And it just, it just did not go over well, <laughs> but, it, but it did what I wanted it to do. And I had our subscription manager find out every member of the board of trustees, majority of whom were white, and made them subscribers to our newspaper. It has to be, but we sent them a copy of the newspaper every time it came out. We changed the print so that it was slick print on the paper, and eventually that, that started in about September, October. So by January, I was in the dean's office and uh, telling me that I was going to have to stop. And I told him I'm not going to stop. So then they brought in the guy from the University of Pennsylvania, and he looked at me and he said, Mr. Murray, what is it that's, uh, what do you want to be in life? And I told him I wanted to be a lawyer so that I can go back to Miami and do right by black people. And he said, what do you want to do? Do you want to run for office? I said, yes, I could be the mayor. He said to me, I'm going to tell you a way that you can be in charge of the whole city and not be, have to be elected. And that really sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you simply get to be a city manager. And he said, there's certain things you're going to have to do. But first of all, you come to my school to learn to be a city manager, and I'm going to give you full pay for everything. But then while you're there, you know, you gain insight, and you become professional, and you join professional organizations, and that's how I joined ASPA, because that was part of the uh, training to be a city manager, 1964. <laughs> oh, that's the city manager. Inkster, Michigan. Anybody heard of Inkster? See how many people, Brandon, you see how many people? Is it Matthew Stryko? <laughs> 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 Brandy is from Detroit now. She's going to say Inkster is not, you know, it's like, it's like a Cleveland and East Cleveland. <laughs> so I became a city manager in Inkster, Michigan. That's my first city. Tell me, what were the issues of the day when you were first city manager? What were the sort of management and uh, management issues facing cities and municipalities? Vietnam War. I became city manager in 1970. The three years before that, 
I had been a part of the, been in the war, and the issue was, in, in almost all cases, uh, Vietnam War. And for the city of Inkster, it was also black versus white. When Henry Ford created the uh, Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan, he had to bring in laborers, and he literally brought in laborers from the south. He created two cities. One was Dearborn, Michigan, and that's where his headquarters was for his company. The city next to it was Dearborn Heights, which is where his white workers settled when they came from the south. And then the city north of that was Inkster, which is where the black workers settled. So our issue was Vietnam War and race. Hmm. What about the fiscal crisis of the city? Didn't that play a part with white flight and leaving? There were no whites there to begin with. Okay. But, but the, uh, there, were, there were whites. We were just 55, 45% black, but it's overwhelming. There were fiscal issues, and that's, and that's important because there were infrastructure issues, and I made my name as a city manager by literally paving streets. Uh, we had, this is 1968 and 69 in Michigan, and we had dirt roads in my city. And it was just wrong. So I led the push to go to the Capitol and make certain that the uh, state understood that we cannot have state highways running through our city that are not paved completely. You know, the crossovers, they might have had pavement going here, but the crossovers were dirt. Now, immediately, you got to come out and do something. And I just raised a big ruckus about that. And eventually, the state legislature changed it and uh, gave us money. We got money to do that. We got money to clean up parks and to build parks. We did not collect a lot of tax money, but we depended on state money. Hmm. What was your next stop? Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is just uh, 70 miles away with uh, 100,000 people. 50,000 or 60,000 of them were students at the University of Michigan. And back then, they first gave the students the right to vote. You can vote at the university site. You didn't have to go back home to vote. Um, the council was 11 people, 10, 10 whites, one black, nine Republicans, two Democrats. The Republican mayor, when uh, he called me into his office, and a recruiter is the one who, who, who got me to sign up. I didn't ask to leave Inkster, but he got me to sign up. And he, he was going to offer me the job. And I asked him, why are you offering me this job? You know, you, it, you're a white Republican mayor and Republican majority. I don't think anything I've done in this state would suggest to you that I'm Republican. <laughs> and uh, he said, Mr. Murray, no. He said, but we have looked carefully at you and we have found that you are black, but you are competent. <laughs> and we have a university over here with 60,000 students, all of them rambunctious, and demanding that this city do everything. And we honestly believe that you can come here, placate these students, and the city will not go broke in the process. And if you can do that, we'll be satisfied. And I gather they were. They were. <laughs> Students were not always. <laughs> <laughs> Students came to me one time and said, we're going to have a marijuana sale on the, on the steps of City Hall. 
I they, said, were, they were before their time. <laughs> well, I mean, that would have been okay. But it was the wrong place, though. <laughs> and, uh, and I told them, no. And they said, you can't tell us, no, it's a public, public building. I said, what is not public is the marijuana selling, you know? So you can't do that here. And they said, you know, we're going to do it. I said, no, you're not going to do it. He said, I said, if you, if you got to do it, go to the county building. <laughs> 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 you know, they got, a, they got an older building. It's real nice, you know. He said, no, we need, we need the uh, publicity from Detroit, the radio television stations to come out here. They will not come out here for the county building, but they'll come out at, for City Hall. So uh, they said, oh, no, it's not going to happen. And, and it did not. Okay. And they did, they did two things. They went across the street to the, uh, the park, and they had their cell. And then uh, nothing happened because their marijuana, pound of marijuana, was just wrapped up paper. And the uh, guy came to me and said, you dumbass, you didn't think we were going to have real marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> He said it was the symbol. It was the symbol side, the symbol. And they got what they wanted, the symbol. So, Cy, when you, 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 the earlier example you talked about in terms of the road pavement and, and thinking about inequity. So social equity has been a big part and focus of the work that you've done as a city manager. How would you compare the social equity challenges in the early part of your career to the challenges that you see today? They are, they are less raw, R-A-W. They are, today, they are, they are sophisticated and educated. When I was coming along in the early part, it was just raw social equity. We just counted numbers. You didn't do this, you didn't do that. You gave this much money here, you didn't give this much money there. Uh, you hired that many people, you did not hire people here. Hmm. You taught that course, you didn't teach that course. You follow what I'm saying? It, it was not, there, there were a lot of ills, I-L-L-S, but they were not really dressed. Even the term social equity, you know, that's, that's a nice, nice, you can talk about that anywhere. But when I was coming on, it was just plain old discrimination where you couldn't talk about it in every place because you won't have anybody on the other side. So that's probably the big difference. Have we made progress? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, would you? No. Oh, yes. I got a... I've got three students sitting right out there in the audience now. Stephen Stan. <laughs> Tell them who you are. He's, he's so nice, but, but he, he, he's a really, really, really big man. And as a result of him having that job with his degree coming here, master's degree, he has been able to help how many in your family? Three. three people. He's been able to help three people. And I'm saying to you that when that young man came here to this school, it was obvious that he was black and he was from Africa. But when we sat down, Fran Hunter and I, with the dean at that time, and said, this man needs to have a scholarship to come to this university. And the dean said, of all the people in the United States, why we got to go all over to Africa to bring somebody? Again, social equity. 
said, because this is who he asked me to bring, he expected he was going to have. So he said, we only have so many scholarships. Well, maybe we need more scholarships. If this young man, we want to come. And the dean said yes and gave us the money for him. Now, I'm thinking that 20 years ago, it might not have happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. So can you tell us how you ended up transitioning into the academy? How did you make that transition? The National Academy? No, into the university. Into See what I mean? You got to be a PhD to understand all that. <laughs> and I'm not a PhD, so I didn't, you know. Well, am I really into the am I really in the academy now? Seriously? You'll always be in the academy. <laughs> but the first time around. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I understood the academy to be a PhD. When you walk, walk across the aisle, the president is giving you a degree, he puts the hood on you, and he says, welcome into the academy of, of something. And that didn't happen to me yet. So, I don't know if I'm fully there. But how did you become involved with it? How did I become involved with the academy? Um, I was working in Columbus, Ohio, with Coopers and Lybrand, the CPA firm. And it happened that the the CPA firms at that time were all amalgamating. There used to be seven of them, the big seven. And they start joining together. Coopers and Lybrand was never wanted to be a part of the other group, but it always went out on its own. And, and they tried to build up their practice so that they would not have to join. And one day, I was there as a consultant I mean a second level person. One day the president of Coopers and Lybran came down from New Jersey to Columbus, Ohio, and they brought me into the office with the managing partner, and he said to me, uh, Mr. Murray, we, I, I've heard of you. You've been doing very well as a, as a salesman because you have to sell now. You're not just doing that to do the work because you've got to get new customers. He said, you've been doing very good work. You, you know, you, he counted out the money that you brought into the firm. And in and, and those days, you were, if it, it, it was not in the book, but you had to be there seven years before you could become a partner. And, but I wasn't there seven years. So he said, you've been doing very well. We want to reorganize. And we would like to promote you to the senior associate level and let you be in charge of the consulting for Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, and your office will be in Detroit. Big salary increase. And I said no. And he couldn't understand that. He said, I'm saying to you that I'm going to offer you this position. He said, you don't want to live in Detroit? I said, no, I have nothing against Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if you really looked at me, I've already lived in Detroit, and I got Detroit clients for Cooper's Library. He said, I know you do. That's why I'm asking you. And I uh, said, no. He said, uh, then why not? And I looked him in his face, and I said to him, you've come to me first time you met me in person, 44-year-old man or 45 or whatever, and you just said to me, I am promoting you, and you are moving. You got, you got to say to me, do you? I want you to move, you know? Or I want you to accept this and be willing to do so and so and so. And he said, oh, you got a problem with the moving. Well, don't worry. Look, the firm will buy your house. The firm will rent your house in Detroit until you find one firm will give you, help you with a down payment on the house, but the wife and children can stay here until all that happens. I said, wait a minute, I got to go out there with, without my wife and children? 
I guess the man said, this is the dumbest ass I work with. <laughs> so the bottom line on that was, no. I said no. And when he left, the agent in charge, the partner in charge, brought me into his office the next day and told me that I need to get my resume in order. And I said, why? He said, because you just told the big boss no. You just, you told him outright no. He said, and so your days are limited here. I said, he didn't say he was going to fire me. He said, he didn't have to say that. <laughs> I'm telling you that you're going to be fired. You know what I mean? So that's when I left. That's when the guy here, the word got around. And I think that Dr. Keller told you last night. The word got around that Cy was going to be looking for a new job. And they called me and asked me to come here. And that's how I got here. Well, Cy, uh, we're going to jump to the, the end of the questions because we're, we're back on schedule. What do you see as the near-term future of city management practice and scholarship? It's good. It's good. Cities are going to have, cities are growing. There are some cities that are losing people, very, very large cities, but there are a whole lot of smaller cities that are going to be bigger cities. And there are used to be suburban cities that are now being called not suburban cities, but I think they call them like second tier cities, or first round cities. And these cities are hiring city managers. And, and I see growth in city management and city managers. And I see growth in, uh, in professional government. Susan, you have a question? Well, son, I know you, other than Louis, Louis Brownlow, you are the only one to have served as president of both ASPA and ICMA, the International City County Managers Association. And um, I think that really speaks volumes relative to your role as both an academic and a practitioner. How do you think our, but our field always seems to struggle with the relationship between yes. academics and practitioners. Right. Obviously, you, you've mastered it. So what, what do we need to be doing more of? Bringing the practitioners into the classroom at a level where the professor is and letting the practitioners talk to the students. We, uh, as, as professionals, we, uh, we do a lot of bringing in other professionals, asking the guy who wrote the book to come and lecture. And that's a PhD lecturing to PhDs and supposedly to students. Uh, so I think that we need to, to hire the uh, city manager who has wrote the PhD, who has the experience in managing, come and talk to the student also who you want to leave and be a manager. All of your students are not going to be going to uh, graduate school, not going to get the PhD. But that list of people who are going to be managers at government level, uh, let them see some managers in the classroom. I think that will help bring it together. Well, this has been an engaging conversation with uh, Sylvester Murray. I want to all of us to thank him and thank him for his service. So thank you, Sai. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, this next panel, I'm proud to be the moderator for. It's uh, Contemporary Challenges Facing Mayors and City Managers. I am Lisa Barno. I'm the Executive Director of the Cuyahoga County and Northeast Ohio Mayors and City Managers Association, um, which represents 122 communities in nine counties. Um, 
The panel we comprise today is a great panel of diverse communities, uh, inner ring um, out from outside the county, uh, larger and smaller communities. But despite all their differences and their varying sizes and economies and demographics, some of their challenges that they face are very similar. Um, housing crisis affected all of them. Uh, the opiate crisis is affecting all of them. Uh, state and local funding has affected all of them. Infrastructure needs um, and many other issues. But together as a group, we work on these challenges amongst our, from our association and there's several other groups out there that work on these challenges. But individually, they face unique uh, situations in their own communities. And I think if they introduce themselves, they'll tell you a little bit about some of the challenges they face, and I think we'll open up to question and answers after that. So Brandon, if you'd like to start. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. How are you today? I am Brandon King, the mayor of the city of East Cleveland. And to sum up our challenges, <laughs> we suffer from a lack of resources. And thinking about resources and all that it entails, I just like to say we suffer from resources. That's our biggest challenge. That's all I have. Hi, I'm, I'm Jane Howington. I'm the city manager for, in Hudson. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, the, the outlook for future city managers is, is good. Northeast Ohio is lacking in them. No offense to mayors, but um, <laughs> so Hudson is um, halfway, kind of halfway in between Cleveland and Akron. I think some people want to push us to Akron, and then people in Akron are pushing us to Cleveland. So we're kind of, kind of lost a little bit in there. Um, I think the top challenges we have, by and far, by and far away, is communication. Communication is so hard today. It's instantaneous. It's so hard to get in touch with your with your residents, and so hard to listen to your constituents because everybody's talking and nobody's listening. Um, and I think the other item that I look at a lot is the divisive environment. The dialogue all the way from the federal level down to the state state level, onto the local level is so divisive that it's very hard for people to find common ground and to know how to compromise anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Tanisha Briley, city manager for the city of Cleveland Heights and pressed into service by Dean Anglin. <laughs> so my name doesn't appear in your program, but happy to be here today. Um, I think I'll summarize, I could, as far as challenges for our community, we could talk about resources, we could talk about talent, attraction, all sorts of things. But I think I'll summarize it by saying, I think our issue in Cleveland Heights right now is a tension between progress and preservation. And, and that's across the board. That's internally for the organization and for the community as a whole. How do we balance those tensions? Um, you know, where, what do we give up on the preservation side in order to make progress? And what progress are we willing to forego in order to preserve some of our history, cultures, and traditions. What isn't serving us well uh, today, and, and what do we want, what city do we want to be in the future? So I think to summarize it, that's how I would describe it. Well, good morning, uh, I'm Matt Zone. I'm fortunate to serve the city of Cleveland as one of its council members, and Jane, we would gladly take Hudson uh, to, <laughs> to join into Cuyahoga <laughs> County and to, to cl the Cleveland region and footprint. Um, you know, I've been on city council a little over 17 years now, and I've had a unique perspective of, of not only how we govern, but how other communities govern. Um, early on, I, I became very involved in the Northeast Ohio City Council Association. I know I see Mayor Wheelow and others who were very active in that organization as well, and, and my colleague Mike Summers, uh, members from Lakewood. Um, I mean, we all live in a region, and and. There are regional issues, and then you have city issues. Um, last year, I had the opportunity of serving as uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Murray. I was uh, president of the National League of Cities, and uh, uh, Tony Samuels, past director of uh, ASPA, said to say hello and send her regards to you. But um, I will tell you the three issues that I think are challenging for the city of Cleveland 
are, are challenging for cities all across America. And, and we'll get into maybe some of the issues a little bit later in this session. But just broadly, the three most challenging issues um, are housing um, and centered at the middle of that conversation is equity, right? How do we have smart housing policies that make sure you build inclusive communities that supply housing um, for, for all people? Uh, some communities will only want to focus on one aspect of housing, and I look forward to getting into, into that conversation with you uh, later in the session. The other is economic mobility and opportunity, um, and centered right in the, the heart of economic mobility and opportunity is equity, but not only equity, it's race. Um, too often, municipal leaders are unwilling to talk about race. I ver feel very comfortable in that space and talking about it, and sometimes decisions that are made inside of city halls all across America, race is never even talked about. Um, and so we need to openly talk about about race and, and centered in the middle of, of economic mobility and opportunity is, is equity. I, I tell people I'm one of nine kids. My mom loved all of us. She had to love some of us more than others. Didn't mean she didn't love us all, but um, and that's how we have to approach that work um, in, in cities. And then the last broad topic is the future of work. Uh, it's changing rapidly. Work is changing. Cities are changing. Um, by 2050, 80% of all truck drivers are going to be unemployed. Um, and so what does that look like and how do we retool um, cities of the future? So those are kind of my big three umbrella issues I'd like to take on to, uh, in this session. Good morning. My name is Mike Summers, uh, Mayor of Lakewood. Uh, the number one near-term challenge is our infrastructure, our underground infrastructure in particular. Uh, and that's driven uh, by our own environmental stewardship responsibilities but also a federal regulation, the Clean Water Act of 1972. And for Lakewood, uh, that's a hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, very technical, uh, very disruptive uh, investment uh, that has to hit bullseyes every dig of the shovel. The big challenge for us, we, we think we figured out the roadmap ahead, uh, but I would say the day-to-day -day, uh, managerial responsibilities that a mayor of Lakewood faces, similar to all my other fellow managers, would be poor service delivery, organization, culture, and performance, and how we can react to that, protect and respond, fix things when they break, and uh, react to external events, and there are a lot of them these days, cost management, urban trends. Uh, Matt talked about many of them. Protect and grow the tax base, create vibrancy, a sense of place, and regional engagement. So that's a full plate for any city manager or mayor. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions I'm going to start throwing out, but feel free to, anytime you guys want to, uh, you know, you had a few topics you want to talk about. Uh, Mayor Summers, I'm going to start with you. Um, your city is very unique. It's very transient. Uh, you also uh, have, you're on the lake, you have, uh, you run your own tax department, and you also do your own wastewater, I believe. Right. right. And water. Uh, and how does this, as a mayor of a city that's not one of the Cleveland, Columbus, or Cincinnati, as a suburban city, how does this, how these challenges impact you as a mayor? Well, I think, I think the conversation we're having today is how uh, a city manager or a mayor can be prepared to handle them. Right. So I would say the, the, the one drama is the, the range of the subjects you just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, from soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. And one of the exciting things about my job is that from one meeting to another, uh, this, it's stunning how the subjects shift and creating a intellectual competence and emotional versatility is a great challenge. And so when we train leaders in an urban setting that have this full range in front of them, I think one of the things we're, we ought to try and, 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 and inculcate in their abilities is the expectation uh, to be able to handle and stay organized over 15 different subjects in the course of an eight-hour day, each of them compelling and dramatic. So how do you do that? And the answer is you've got to build a team. Uh, no one mayor or city manager can begin to address these. So part of the challenge of the range is to build competence. And that's organization culture and performance, building capacity deeper into the organization to make decisions, appropriate ones, creating alignment of resources. That's a full-time job unto itself. And by the way, that's a major challenge for a private sector leader or a, pri or a public sector. doesn't matter. Uh, those are unique changes. So creating organizational leadership uh, to be able to handle complex issues, I think, is a task before any organization, particularly one like Levin. 
So team, team building and competence. Okay. And uh, Jane, um, Hudson is uh, outside the county, and it's, uh, it's, but it's a very historic community. Um, some of the challenges facing yours that are your community that's unique uh, is historical preservation while dealing with the growth that you're um, en enabling. How do you see what to what does that what your city challenges that you see and how what what problems are you facing with that growth? Sure, I think a lot of this is Cleveland Heights is probably similar to this. Um, it's the preservation versus the future. Mm -hmm. How do you future proof something? And you know one. One phrase that we say in, in Hudson is, in order to preserve the past, you have to afford the future. Um, and we work hard on trying to future-proof the city by diversifying, um, looking toward tomorrow's workforce and recognizing that um, economic development is different um, and it's evolving. There's not as much bricks and mortar anymore. There's a lot more remote work. Um, there's a lot more shared office space. We don't have the big corporate headquarters. You know, you're not going to attract those and so on. So we have to work smarter to bring in economic development and bring in jobs to be able to afford the infrastructure. Um, four and a half years ago, we started our own broadband service. Our um, Flossy Broadband is gigabit service because we couldn't get providers to um, provide the service that our businesses needed and, and once income tax goes down with lost jobs then it's harder to um, handle our infrastructure improvements so the future proofing goes hand in hand with preservation uh, that's probably one of the main challenges and it is very much a difficulty in progress versus preservation um, change versus no change and you know, we're developing our second phase of our downtown area right now, and that's, there was a lot of blight back there. It was old factory land. The city's been, been coordinating the purchase and the remediation of the land. Um, we have a private developer that we're partnering with. Um, there was absolutely nothing historical about it, yet there's a lot of um, consternation um, on the part of some of our community that it's change and change is scary. Mm -hmm. I think that would go to you as well, Tanisha. I know that uh, Cleveland Heights is going through um, a lot of changes back and forth, but maybe not quite as much of uh, the booming economic as an outer ring suburb, but um, you still have a lot going on in Cleveland Heights. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges that are facing you as an inner ring community? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think I absolutely agree with with everything my colleagues have, have said so far. Um, as an inner ring, you know, the challenges are um, uh, constant and evolving, right? So uh, resources and, and, you know, our tax base and the hit that we all took as entering suburbs with the housing crisis, um, the loss of population, we're all, we're all still trying to climb out of that hole. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, as city manager, I became city manager almost six years ago, we were facing a fiscal crisis that, that I don't think anyone really understood. Um, so I got to be the lucky one to peel back, that, um, peel back that onion. So the first few years was really about stabilization. And I think that we've achieved that now and, and we're trying to move forward. But what does that mean uh, to the community? And I think I think trying to get the community to coalesce around one vision of what that looks like is challenging in a place like Cleveland Heights where we are um, uh, rebellious and gritty, I think, it's, <laughs> right? <laughs> we are gritty and rebellious uh, as a community. And, and so right now, I think it's, it's, it's imperative that, that, that the leaders of, of the community, both myself, um, my team that I'm privileged to lead one of which is in the audience, go Joe, and the city council, you know, our job at this point is really trying to get the community to coalesce around what that vision should be. So that, you know, we sometimes feel like we take one step forward, we have a, a very incredible uh, economic development project happening in our city that, you know, two years ago wouldn't have been possible, $100 million investment, and it's taken a year and a half 
and we're still not at ground, shovel in the ground because we want to continue to have the same conversation about this. It's basically fear of change, right? So getting the residents to go along with getting you. the residents to go along. So it's, we can't keep taking these sort of one off bites at the apple, trying to do things that we know are good if the community is not on board. So how do we how do we get them there? Because we're going to need wins at our back to make some of these decisions that we need to make. And that's difficult to do in election cycles and, and community outrage over things that really just are about our fear of things being different. And Matt, with, with um, that in mind, um, former president of the National League of Cities and, and active in that group, um, what do you see as that's unique to the Cleveland and the challenges, but then also that all communities are facing uh, across the country? You know, uh, one of the things that's certainly unique about Cleveland that I've become aware of when I, uh, when I was able to travel the country and meet with mayors all across this great nation um, we have a network of local nonprofits, community development corporation mm -hmm. that still exist. Um, in some cities, they only have one or maybe two. Um, in Cleveland, at the height, we probably had 32 or 33, I think downward down to about 24 that work on not only the physical development of our distinct neighborhood, but the human development of the people who live in those communities. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a blessing and have been able to share how in the city of Cleveland, how the city of Cleveland looks at those community development partners as our partners. Um, for the money that we give them, there's an expectation um, on, on how they perform and do that work and do that engagement. Whenever there's a development project, um, we require prior to those issues coming to our planning commission for approval that there's extensive community engagement because as the dynamics that Tanisha described in a very fiercely uh, independent and uh, smart city like Cleveland Heights is the residents, they have an expectation that they're a part of the process. Um, and I've always taken uh, through a lot of the um, lessons I've learned uh, as a student in this uh, wonderful uh, university is that you have to educate the community, make them feel like they're part of the planning process. And when you do that, there's less drama on the back end and it's easier to get projects approved. So Cleveland, I think, does that component really well, uh, how we engage community, how we bring them along, um, how we work with community development partners. Um, some of the things that we, we, we are challenged with um, uh, that we've been able to learn from other cities is um, how we're dealing with the, the shrink of population. You know, we're, we're a shrinking region. Other regions are growing. And I continually talk about regions. It's just not Cleveland. People always want to put all of the woes of Northeast Ohio on the back of Cleveland. Um, and the challenges that we face as a city, Brandon's dealing with it in East Cleveland. Tanisha's dealing with it in Cleveland Heights. Mike's dealing with it in the city of Lakewood. Um, and, and so we are an, a connected region. And we need to start taking regional perspectives on how we solve this problem. Air pollution and crime doesn't stop at a municipal border. Uh, we have 57 cities in Cuyahoga County and two townships, mm -hmm. 57 communities. The population in, in my ward alone equals 52 of those communities. And so there is a lot of fragmentation. And so how can we share and work cooperatively with one another? And that's been one of the things I think has been enlightening as I've traveled um, the country to see how a struggling region like Louisville had, took a courageous effort in the early 60s to go to a metro form of government. Now, I'm not here saying that we should go to a metro form of government, although I would probably be the first endorser of that, um, <laughs> that um, if we want to deal with issues of infrastructure, infra issues of equity, issues of housing, if issues of workforce development. You can't do it 59 ways. I'm sorry, it just won't work. And, and really, that's where uh, 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 an institution like this college could be such a pivotal player in helping to shift the way we approach on how we do government. It's unsustainable. Brandon, I didn't say that I saved you here for, <laughs> you could probably do a whole course on this, this subject. Yes. Um, 
my question to you is coming into it as uh, when you became a mayor, was there any of the challenges that you didn't foresee that East Cleveland was facing that ended up toward the top of your list? And even if not, some, if it was what you expected, um, and you mentioned resources at your top, if you could expand upon that a little bit as to <coughs> what resources you're lacking, what ways that you're trying to increase those resources, or additional help you might need from a university or from other communities or from the state. Um, give you something to think about here. <laughs> big, big question. Uh, thank you for it. And a lot of it, yes, I have uh, considered, thought about, and have had to deal with being born and raised in East Cleveland, growing up through the ranks, volunteering, going into politics on city council, I was aware of a lot of the challenges that we face firsthand. Of course, moving into the mayor's position, you then have to deal with them mm -hmm. firsthand. You, you get a chance to actually uh, see the numbers, feel the numbers, and then it's your responsibility to deal with it. So when I, uh, when I say lack of resources, I try to just say that because it covers the entire spectrum. So what we suffer from in East Cleveland is the diminishing tax base, whether it's property taxes, income taxes, and then of course that leads to the diminishing resources in other areas. For example, we, we, have become, we have become a training ground for our police and fire. So we get police and fire cadets, half of them don't make it there six months. Yet they go to other cities and are promoted, right, simply because of the training that they get in East Cleveland on the ground in that discipline. We also suffer from a lack of resources to fix our infrastructure. We're over 100 years old. So when I listen to a number of my colleagues up here, I'm wishing I just had some of the, and I don't want to call them simple problems, but the one or onesie twosies. We have a city that was built out for about 40,000. We're down to 17. Wow. 17, average income hovers around 20,000. I have with me today my executive assistant, who's also our human resource director. So I have, I have merged departments. We're, we're down city personnel. It's, it's a real challenge to run a city without the resources to do it. Is there any way that you think, um, any, any light at the end of the tunnel that you might see would be some sort of help? Um, is it state? Is it uh, more merging of local cities? Is it um, more help from other communities? I know uh, many communities have, have su supported East Cleveland through, um, through ambulance runs or, or mm -hmm. donations and such. So there's been a lot of collaboration along that aspect. Um, certainly not enough, I'm sure. Um, is there anything else that you see uh, needed immediately that you could, could be addressed? So yes, and so I'd like to thank Cleveland Heights, South Euclid, Lynnhurst, Richmond, we've had all the surrounding communities uh, come in and help us with fire and EMS. Uh, they have a, a shared working relationship in that regard. From an, an educational and what Cleveland State could do, we would need help. And we actually reached out to the law school here in search of interns to then help us be beef up our staff and get through some of the litigation and the other legal challenges we face. And we have been successful in getting one intern with a small stipend that, that we provide the intern. Uh, so we could create win-win opportunities in that regard. You have students that need real world experience. We have issues and learning opportunities from them that could be addressed I'm not, uh, I'm in favor of strategic partnerships and regionalization, particularly from the perspective of, pol of, of fire and EMS, not police, because I totally believe in uh, community policing, which would require 
residents in the community to know intimately the police officers that uh, secure, secure them and that a local community would need local representation as they are on the ground and know what's needed in their own community as opposed to someone far removed, more or less dictating what happens in that uh, area. So Cleveland State University and the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs, we are working right now, and I hope I'm not uh, way ahead of myself, we are working with your dean to help us create a vision, a vision plan to, to help move the city forward. Fantastic. That, uh, Cleveland State and, and um, Tri-T to some extent has, we've done collaboration efforts. Uh, I know we put together a study recently on uh, collaboration that should be uh, released pretty soon um, on all the efforts that communities do. Um, also working on uh, economic development uh, tool for cities through Cleveland State University and there's workforce training programs that we par partnered up with uh, CSU and Tri-C um, on. Is there any other programs you think that um, are, are ways a university or colleges, since we have many of them in this region, can help uh, support the challenges that communities are facing? Well, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, future work. Work is changing, you know. <laughs> We're thankful we have a lot of uh, workforce development components, uh, Cuyahoga Community College, but um, work is changing. Um, you know, the, the master's program here in planning at the Levin College, getting people, you know, our, our, our city planning director, Freddie Collier, who's an alum here, you know, he's really thinking about what's the future of, 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 of our city look like? We need to start planning not for you know, what we need to make sure that new development today or that new infrastructure project today, but how are we doing it with smart sensors? How are we uh, preparing our city for autonomous vehicles? How are we pre preparing for automation? Um, that's really where the college can be helpful, not only within um, our all of our respective cities, but educating that workforce to think about um, uh, what the future work is going to look like, Tanisha said, I mean, or I think Jane said, you know, work is changing. You're not going to get uh, uh, the big Amazon coming here to Cleveland and, um, or, or a region where that's going to have 50,000 jobs. Most people are going to be working remotely. So how can we have that smart uh, digital fiber? How can we have the ability to communicate? Um, really, I think um, that's something that um, I'm really concerned about. Uh, how are people going to be able to be employed? how they can be able to provide for their family. Um, it's something that I, I think a lot about. I'd also like to mention um, that I think that Hudson has embraced the fact that we can be a laboratory for other communities. And we've been doing a lot of work with public-private partnerships on coming up with things. Right now we're working on coming up with um, smart technology on wireless um, early warning fire suppression systems for historic downtown so that you, if you have 16 buildings that are you know bumper to bumper and they're all owned separately you're never going to be able to get all of those building owners to put a joint system in um, so we're championing that and working with Honeywell on coming up with um, with, and our broadband is the backbone of it, but coming up with a fire suppression system, there are thousands and thousands of small downtown, historic downtowns that have the same problem. And once we can act as a laboratory, then Honeywell can go out and, and work with those communities to get that done. So when we're, we're doing the same thing with um, smart technology on our, um, the signalization, and we've been working with other communities and helping them with their broadband and working with, I'm working with the legislature now and trying to come up with ways to do special assessments so that your, your rural areas that are never gonna be able to, to, to do that can do that. So we feel like if we can act as a laboratory that can help other communities with whatever solutions, that's another way of regionalizing. Okay, Mayor Summers. Well, a stunning revelation 
from some folks in Lakewood as they prepare their tax returns with this new tax law <laughs> is that there is no economic advantage for most of Lakewood homes to own. Mm -hmm. The standard deduction, 12500 is actually higher than the cumulative deduction of interest, property tax, and then you have the burden of maintenance. That's right. Now, Lakewood is a big rental community, but the fact of the matter, if you take away the government's traditional subsidy of home ownership, mm -hmm. that is a game changer of how we think about housing, housing maintenance, housing ownership. Uh, that is a national question now, in my opinion, certainly a regional one because our housing is lower than in cost than many other parts of the country. And so we have a harder time meeting these thresholds to make it competitive to this new tax law. So I would expect, Dean England, that's a great conversation that, that probably on April 16th, when people come to this realization <laughs> uh, that, that we're going to have to figure out what all this means, because yeah. it is new knowledge, I think, to most of us. Yeah. Interesting. I'll, uh, I'll jump in and amplify something that Cy mentioned earlier as, as something we should be doing and looking at. And, and I know that Dean England is working on this um, at the college is really getting back to um, this college in particular, inspiring our, the next generation of, mm -hmm. of local government leaders. Yeah. Um, you know, the sentiment in the country is, 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 I think local government management is taking a hit, um, as I'm sure all government you know, students aren't aspiring to these roles. Um, you know, the, the issues of the day um, tend to cause students, and I, I get a chance to, to be with them from time to time. I, I get to team teach here at the college, and everyone seems to be um, interested in nonprofit management, which is terrific. We, we have lots of nonprofits in Cleveland that need good leadership, but we certainly need those students looking uh, to take these positions in local government, and, and I think that we all can play a role in that, and we need the college uh, to really sort of you know, get us back on that track of, of inspiring students to look to government, and particularly local government, for opportunities yeah. to lead. Um, because I think what they're learning, the energy that they'll bring, their ideas, um, is really what we need to carry us mm -hmm. into the future. If, if I could add to that, so one of the things that we also are challenged with is our personnel. So if you could imagine, our personnel are, are underpaid in every position, mm -hmm. and many of them have been there for a number of years. So as I think about competing for the future, we don't necessarily have the resources to do that. So from a university perspective, maybe there's a way we can help cities to then retrain their employees or re-educate their employees. I've got employees that aren't computer savvy. So instead of sending an email, we're back and forth with pieces of paper. That, that kind of brings me, and that was one of the topics we had previously. Um, the state has uh, put a lot of requirements on communities and unfunded mandates and, and um, caused some of the challenges that you face. Um, but recently we had a conversation about uh, finance directors and building commissioners and the, all the requirements that go into that, but yet cities can't afford to pay what the private sector pays. So that creates a shortage in, in those fields. Is that one of the challenges that any of your communities are facing? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the building, the, the Ohio Board of Building Standards, um, you know, that's definitely a state issue that, that we should all be uh, behind. And I, I think I've been bringing that up at our meeting mm -hmm. for the past <laughs> couple of years because the standards that the state has set have sort of created this revolving door of building commissioners jumping from community to community uh, to get basically the best deal. So for the last several years, it's been difficult for suburban communities to maintain their building commission staff and I could go into detail about all the requirements and the, the certifications, but essentially it's state requirements that, that have created this problem. We have had to partner with a private company, which is Safe Built, 
and some other communities are going that direction. Others are trying desperately to hold on to their, um, their in-house building commission staff. That to me is one of the easiest things to regionalize because those codes are uniform. Mm -hmm. They're state codes. Um, there's no reason that you don't need to have local knowledge of the community in order to efficiently and effectively administer a building department program. So I've talked with the county about it. I've talked to other mayors about it. I think once, um, once all the communities kind of go through you know, a couple of years of having two or three different times that you're all, always looking for a building commissioner, I think we'll get to the point where we recognize this is something we can regionalize and do fairly easily. Um, but that it's created a hardship and a burden and, and we partner with Safe Build, but that can't be, that's not a long-term solution, um, right? We don't wanna be beholden to whatever the next contractual uh, negotiation will be for something mm -hmm. that's so critical as building safety in our community. Brandon. <laughs> yeah, it just, again, resources. We have literally one and a half building inspectors. They're both part-time, which is why we say one and a half. We have not been able to adequately inspect our buildings, apartment buildings, and housing structures for decades. And as such, the buildings get to a point of disrepair. Not only that, our housing codes are not up to date. Our housing fees are not up to date. I mean, we're, we're charging uh, basically below average uh, fees for simple permits. One of the earliest things I did coming in was to look across the spectrum at the various cities to see simply where they were with their occupancy permits. Mm -hmm. And many of you may know it, it wound up in court as we attempted to then raise the standards of our charter and our fees to then uh, get basically into a 21st century seat. So there's no way we could have functioned as a city building and housing department at $10 per permit when other cities are averaging around 100. So again, I'd go back to the university. If there was a way, maybe help us review our charter to then make these changes where necessary. Before I open it up to any question and answers, I, I'd like to run by one more topic, and that is um, infrastructure. I recently met with, um, we had a group of mayors that met with um, mayors from Czech Republic and uh, Croatia, Poland, Italy, and um, I one other country. And um, their number one thing that they stated about being in this region was that the roads were like they were in you know, Iraq or something. <laughs> they said they, they couldn't believe being in America, but specifically in Ohio, how bad our roads were. And um, I know the governor, we, the, the association recently endorsed the governor's uh, gas tax proposal. I wanted to know how infrastructure needs are impacting your budget, your your day-to-day -day challenges that you face um, as your roads are, are deteriorating. So uh, uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, our chief operating our, uh, officer, Darnell, I'll give everyone a wave. <laughs> that guy is uh, Mayor Jackson's chief operating officer and he's tasked with uh, coming up with a capital plan that deals with our roads. You know, the city of Cleveland, 80 years ago, we had 10,000 roads. We had nearly a million people in our city. Today, we have 10,000 roads and about 400,000 people. Uh, so we still have to maintain not only the roads, but the infrastructure that's below ground. And it's, it's a challenge, it's daunting. You know, Tanisha and Mike and myself all sit on the NOACA board. Mm -hmm. and, and this guy, I've never seen a more passionate leader around infrastructure than I can't wait to hear what he has to say on this topic. But I, I will say that, you know, the city of Cleveland, um, we were so concerned uh, three years ago with, uh, uh, actually was first introduced by uh, President Obama with eliminating the municipal um, uh, uh, income tax bond, uh, our ability to bond out money and, and that tax exempt municipal bond. Um, and then President Trump in, in, in uh, his proposal uh, moved to try to do away with it as well. 
that we bonded out nearly $100 million um, to just ramp up and, and invest in our infrastructure. We've gone to a very systematic um, process in how we uh, redo our roads. Uh, we've adopted a pay pavement management program that looks at a 11 or 13 different indicators, Darnell? 13 different indicators, and now it's fact-based, and it's based on we're doing the worst roads first because the previous model was a very political model where, where council people had a lot of say on which roads were done. We're taking the politics out of it, and now it's, it's fact-based. It's based on the greatest need, um, and the city has even ramped up a greater amount that we're investing than we have done previously in the past. And over time, we know that we'll, we'll redo all of our roads in a shorter period of time under this model, but our roads with now an aggressive crack ceiling program um, and um, a sidewalk and curb program, that our infrastructure is poised for the next several decades to, to really improve. But a lot of that work was done by the city because we had the state walking away. Uh, over the last eight years, we've probably lost over $200 million that rightfully should have came back to the city of Cleveland, not only in the local government fund, but in, uh, with so many other eliminations and in, in some tax reform measures that the previous state administration has implemented. I think the new governor realizes the crunch that cities are facing with, um, but we have a very diverse uh, revenue portfolio that comes in to our city, not only income tax, but um, uh, other aspects where we can charge for fees. You know, I, I'm curious to hear what Mike has to say. He's 95% of his city's residential. And what's your thoughts about infrastructure? Well, the important thing about infrastructure is we have to look at it as an investment, not a cost. Yeah. We have no choice. Cleveland's at the dawn of its third century. Lakewood and most other cities in the region, dawn of their second century. You have to take a 100-year view of this. And when it's 100 years old, you have to renew it. And, and it's just only cities, by the way, only governments will recognize the value of the infrastructure. Private sector puts no value. They expect that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this burden. I'm so disappointed in our Ohio legislature that they're taking a cost view of it. Uh, we have no choice. I mean, these visitors from Eastern Europe, they're spot on. It's like it's an embarrassment. We are a third world in so many aspects, and we need to do better. So we have to shift this view to be an investment and an obligation. And when you have an investment and an obligation, you just figure out how to do it. It's not a debatable point. It's got, it has to be an absolute commitment. Our challenge is we have no partners at the state level, and even sure. worse yet, totally absent partners at the federal level. Uh, the idea that there is no cavalry out there, whatever we're going to do, it's going to be done locally, has to be understood by all parties. And I agree with Matt, we have to take a regional view. Uh, I drive into Cleveland all the time from Lakewood. My experience of re living in this region is shaped by Cleveland in every, every way. So Lakewood has a stake in Cleveland's success, uh, and we ought to figure out how to share that. Tom Beyer, one of your great alumni, yeah. emeritus professors, argues about income, regional income uh, capacity sharing. Mm -hmm. Mayor King over there, I, I don't know how he shows up every day. Uh, I mean, honestly, <laughs> the challenges you face with the resources you don't have, That's it's right. almost an impossibility. Yeah. So we have these, these deserts in our region that are just struggling, and they're, we're, they're, we're surrounding them. Uh, we have to go through them. Uh, Mayor Lichen argued that uh, entering suburbs are the connective tissue for the region. And they're abs he's absolutely right. I mean, we can't ignore uh, East Cleveland in the region. We can't. Uh, we, we travel through it. They are part of us. So working together and figuring out how to finance this is what, what our future has to be. We have no choice. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, what, what good does it do to have perfectly smooth roads in Beechwood and then you, you know, everywhere else you go, yeah. you, you have issues? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. And our, our approach to funding these core services that the entire region needs to absorb um, it's the same argument we can make with school funding. It's the same issue, that these things need to be looked at um, less parochially and more collectively because it, it makes, it does me no good if I get out of Cleveland Heights with no damage to my tires and then I get to <laughs> Cleveland and I've got to file a claim. It, it does, how does that help our region? How does that help Cleveland Heights at, at the end of the day? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely not. And I think if I could just add, um, I know with the governor's um, gas tax and the legislature, and you've alluded to that, that what the needs are, we're not, they're not meeting, but the cost of infrastructure is rising because of the, the labor shortage. Mm -hmm. And it's more, so we've had to go out and rebid several of our programs because the cost estimates that were very good a couple of years ago aren't covering at all. So, you know, really when you get that extra money and everybody's going, hurrah, we've got extra money, it's not spread very far. So can, can I just add, uh, this is really important. Um, Jane and Mike both alluded to it, you know, our, the federal government has been absent. Um, you know, the last time we did a robust na federal uh, in, uh, national infrastructure bill was in 1993. Um, they did not uh, index it uh, when they did the gas uh, tax and, and it's ha having a, a horrible effect. What the state legislator proposed, the House, the, where the governor proposed 18 cents, the House knocked it down to 10, 10 and a half cents. The Senate now I hear, they're thinking of even in knocking it um, further down to what, six or six. seven. Um, but you know, at the heart of it, what, what is, um, Professor Murray, it's equity, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, we have a, a state legislature and, a, and an administration in Columbus that doesn't think about poor people and doesn't think about public transportation and how people, if you want to create economic mobility and opportunity for all, create affordable opportunities so people can get to jobs, can get to the doctor in a, in a, in a, uh, in a very uh, cost-effective manner. I know Mayor Wheelow, who sits on the RTA board, her and her colleagues struggle with this issue every single day. People almost feel like public transportation is a scar, right? I have my RTA pass. I use bus. I use the rapid as often as I can. If more of us supported it locally and put pressure on decision makers, people like us, but pe particularly people who work in Columbus and in DC, I think we could create um, better mobility for, for the neediest because if you can create opportunities for the poorest people in our community to get point A, point B, it doesn't only help um, the poorest in our community, it helps all of us. And, 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 and the, the conversation has become so divisive, it's become a partisan conversation, it's become an urban versus rural, and really, I mean, we're, we're just a network and, and we need to improve how we fund public transportation. I'd like to open it up to, uh, you've heard a lot of the challenges, if I could open up to a question, go ahead.
So if, if I could take the first question, uh, and then my colleagues might want to talk about that as well as about education. Um, Jane's former mayor, uh, Bill Kern, uh, myself, uh, Bruce Akers, um, Mayor Lyons, the former mayor of Richfield, were founders of the Northeast Ohio Regional Prosperity Initiative. Um, it's a, something that I believe in. Uh, we've held panels here at this university. What Zach was alluding to is, again, you heard me talk about we are a regional. We operate within a region. Um, and if we move towards a smart growth planning opportunity within our region, so you don't have municipalities working against one another, you know, that whole crazy conversation around Amazon with the richest man on the planet and every city in America fawning over him and wanting to throw all kinds of money his way was just ridiculous to me. Um, and we, if we could go to a process where we can plan for smart growth within our region, but do it in a way that shares revenue, then you can lift up all communities. You can lift up in East Cleveland, in the Cleveland Heights, in the Lakewood, where that you take a baseline of your taxes over the past three years, and then if the following year you do better, well, then you're paying into a regional fund that is shared. But if you do less, well, then you receive some of that revenue. That has been widely successful in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, Portland, Oregon, pre-1970, it was a cesspool up there. It wasn't the cool, chic, trendy, hip community that it is today. They adopted a smart growth plan. And so a university like this, educating people around land use and planning so we're not cannibalizing. I couldn't take this opportunity well without mentioning Dr. Wendy Kellogg. You know, Precious Greenfields, she's been a champion around sustainability. We continue to build stuff out in the hinterlands without reinvesting in, in inner ring suburbs and inner ring cities. Um, and, and we should do more of that and should do more and move towards a regional framework of not only regional planning, but revenue sharing. I would like to add just um, when you say that people from Hudson come in and use your services, 80% of our residents work outside Hudson. All of their income tax goes to the communities that they work in. Most of them, a good portion of them, work in Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. So their income tax goes to Cleveland. We have a 100% tax credit, and we aren't changing it because we know that they use your ser the Cleveland services mm -hmm. or wherever they, they work. So we actually have we would probably benefit if we pooled, pooled all, all of our income tax money. Massachusetts used to do that. They collected all, the, all of the income tax or all of the taxes, and they reallocated according to population and, and valuation. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that here in Ohio, but um, again, if, if someone works in Cleveland from, that lives in Hudson, they don't pay for our services. They don't None of their money goes, their income tax goes to um, fix Hudson's roads, they go to fix Cleveland's roads. So um, much of what we do to, in Hudson to try and increase our, um, our value to the region does go to schools because as we increase our values, the values are property taxes, the, the, the schools get more of that. now. I'm not a, an educator, so I don't know the funding mechanisms. Once again, other, other states, they would reallocate those a little. I don't know how we do that here, but um, I, I can't really speak to, to education with the exception of um, tomorrow's workforce, and you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's workforce is gonna be completely different than a lot of the workforce that we, we have today and yet a lot of our schools are not changing their educational practices. Our students are not being, when they graduate from high school, if they graduate from high school, they're not trained to problem solve. They might be trained to um, complete a sen sentence or something, but they, they're not prepared for the problem solving that they're gonna have to do to, for the jobs of tomorrow. And I think our whole education system really needs to change and focus on 
future solutions and future thinking on how we're going to problem solve and get our kids able to um, to move between professions and, and careers. Mm -hmm. And if I could with education, um, it is definitely, it may not have been mentioned here because it, it is an over everybody's head kind of topic. It's, it's always there. Um, but education is one of the top five priorities we, the Mayors and Managers Association has uh, made on their list for this year. So it is a priority for, for all cities. I would say on education that is important. I spent eight years on the Lakewood School Board and uh, and it is a separate jurisdiction in, in Lakewood. It isn't in Cleveland. And uh, we work collaboratively with our fellow elected board members and superintendents. And they are riveted on K-12, through which is their core mission. But the one area we share is zero through five years old. That's right. And I think we ha all rec recognize that as a, as a national society, we are under-investing in that part of our world. And I think folks in households with lesser means pay a disproportionate penalty for the lack of, uh, of attention to that. So I would, I think we accept the challenge that somehow, uh, and we, and by the way, this is an area that has no structural funding to it, K uh, zero through five years old, but, but we have to figure a way to do better, all of us. I, could take I, I would like to yeah. piggyback on the mayor sure. of uh, Lakewood because the city of East Cleveland is, is similar. We have a separate elected official to run the school Many of you have been following it. We are under state receivership, so we have a CEO mm -hmm. now running the school. And from my understanding, he is doing a phenomenal job at building a camaraderie. And I've actually met with him, and we pledge to work with one another, uh, the city and the schools, to help increase education and the after school programs. If I could add on to the rethinking of the local government funds, which have been cut and have drastically hurt our city. Our city does have a number of strengths that due to uh, state regulations, we can't capitalize on. So I think that if the state were to rethink that and let cities uh, capitalize on some of their opportunities, I think that would also help. In fact, it would help us in a way we wouldn't necessarily need the local government funds. One more question? I don't have a question, but uh, I have an opportunity to offer all of you. Uh, the organization that I work with has uh, an opportunity for the young people in your community, an opportunity to serve as part of the largest growing demographic that, that is coming, and that's people who are living with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, we advocate for forming dementia friendly communities. We have intergenerational projects where we work with young students in middle school and high school and college to involve them working with those people. Matt Bell knows who I am. Mayor Summers knows who I am. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity here to, to change the world. Uh, we do an event every year, the weekend after St. Patrick's Day, this year, in 2019, there are 126 awareness raising events in 19 countries around the world. And that all started here in the city of Cleveland back in 2014. This is something that I hope you all be willing to take advantage of because it's free. We offer opportunities to train your first responders and dementia sensitivity. We work with the Cleveland EMS department already. I'd like to thank our panel today. Thank you very much. We have um you want me to next panel? You want me to catch you back up or you want me to introduce the next panel? Okay. Um, the next panel is Innovations from the Ground Up. Um, I'd like to invite them to come up. Uh, Clayton Wuchik, uh, Wukich, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> who is the Associate Professor and MPA Program Director for the Living College. He'll be your moderator. Everybody would come up. Thank you very much. Thank you.
pass it up here. Good morning. I'm Clayton Wukic, Associate Professor of Public Administration, MPA Director um, here at the Levin College. I am one of the faculty, one of the new faculty here that are trying to live up to the bar that Professor Murray set. He set a very high bar, so we're trying to live up to his legacy and empower the next generation of, of students and learners here. So we're going to do this. We're going to start today and honor Professor Murray talking about innovation, innovation in local government. And we have an esteemed and experienced panel to, uh, to help us have this conversation today. And we're going to try to answer some questions just such as, in local government, how do we make things better, faster, less expensive? How do we leverage emerging technology? And how do we bring people together to address very difficult problems? Those are some of the questions that we want to try to address in this panel. Um, but again, we have an esteemed panel, and, um, and we're happy to have them. We're honored to have them. We're going to take a minute and just go down the panel, and I want to allow or ask all of the panelists to introduce themselves and to, um, to let us know where they're coming from. Darnell? Uh, good morning. My name is Darnell Brown. I'm Chief Operating Officer for the City of Cleveland. Good morning. My name is Natoya Walker Minor, and I serve as the Chief of Public Affairs for the City of Cleveland. Mayor Georgine Wheeler from the City of South Euclid. Uh, Obed Pasha, Assistant Professor here at the Levin College. Leon Wilson, um, Chief of Digital Innovation and Chief Information Officer at the Cleveland Foundation. So we'll start off with Mayor Wheelow. Mayor, South Euclid has instituted a Green Neighborhoods Initiative. And it's focused on enhancing housing with green re rehabilitation projects, community gardens, parks. I'm wondering if you could start us off and tell us a little bit about that project and how it came about. So many of you remember the housing crisis that we had back in 2008, 2009. Around 15% of our homes at that time were going through some sort of process in the foreclosure process, you know, foreclosing. And we sat around and we talked about how could we turn this into an opportunity? Who is the emerging economy? And we came up with the Green Neighborhoods Initiative, and we went out and we uh, wrote two grants. Uh, one was uh, with the um, HUD Neighborhood Stabilization Program. It was very competitive. We won it, and we received um, $800,000. And then we received $300,000 again in a competitive grant from the first suburbs development council mm -hmm. and we use that money to begin restoring our neighborhoods community gardens pocket parks new housing think about this there was 1200 homes at that time out of our 9000 that were in some kind of crisis so we looked at tearing homes down for the first time demolition in, in our community uh, we ended up tearing down about 120 and then we said to ourselves, how are we going to manage this process? Uh, again, the last panel talked about it. We didn't have a lot of staff. Governments cannot take nonprofit money. So we sat back and we came up with One South Euclid, a community development corporation uh, that was made up of three people in the community. When I asked them to step up in uh, 2009, we now have uh, 20 members on that uh, CDC. They're actually uh, grown their organization to have subcommittees, so they now are giving grants for exterior maintenance, snow plowing for seniors, and grass cutting so they can stay in their homes and maintain them, storefront renovation, and things like City Jam. Hmm. They will give neighborhoods $500 to throw a block party or bring food trucks into those um, small pocket parks. They sponsor big events like um, our, our Rock the Block. But what they've done is uh, they really stepped up as a, as, as a community group because the thing that we realized was in government, there's so many obstacles. So we said to ourselves, let's get rid of those obstacles and use a CDC, and that's what we did. And we've used all kinds of green techniques. I've actually put... Uh, to the side a bunch of information because I don't want to dominate it because it would be a total 
uh, conversation. But I want to tell you, the most important thing is to look at the emerging economy. And those are the young people. When I became mayor in 2004, the average age was 64 in South Dakota is now 37. You know, idling is a big thing in a community. You know, young people like to be outside. They don't want to smell all of that. So you have to bring in idling ordinances. How can you bring these young people here and then also get them to be part of your community? And using One South Euclid and meeting a lot of the young people, we also turned our boards and commissions. The average age on our board and commission is probably about 27 years old. Nice. That raises a problem, though, when, most, when you're trying to manage. So, you know, we really use the green neighborhoods to, to kick it off. Thank you very much. This next question is for Darnell and Natoya, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us about the innovation that you're seeing occurring in the city of Cleveland. Well, um, I'll start by saying every since Mayor Jackson has been in office over the last 13 and a half years, we've had a spirit of innovation. Uh, Darnell can, will really talk about the Operation Efficiency Task Force, which is what we initially started with as a cost savings measure where we were able to save with $26 million over two years throughout the city of Cleveland. At that same time, we began the ideation around public square, what it would look like, how do we remove the homeless population that was monopolizing the four quadrants on public square, and how do we turn that around into an area, safe area, where we effectively manage the faith-based organizations that provide the food and the clothing so that the food would be safe we also began to take a deep dive into permanent supportive housing and what that would look like and who we would partner with as we were moving forward. A few years later, we began to delve into community benefit agreements. We began to do that because we recognized at the time there was a, an estimated $2.7 billion of investment that was coming into the city of Cleveland with the casino, university hospitals, and the work that they were doing, renovations at Brown Stadium. And so we began to think about how do we really capitalize on the economic trajectory for everybody, not just for those that can take advantage of our new hotels and, our, and the improvements in our stadiums, but how do we link into the workforce? How do we prepare a workforce? How do we ensure inclusion for Cleveland contractors, minority and female business contractors, how do we begin to link apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship in the construction work that's going on in Cleveland? And we began a three-year three -year campaign, if you will, working with the State of Ohio Apprenticeship Council so that we can have Max Hayes High School, the students that go through that program, certified through that program. And lastly, I'll just say in the last 18 months or so, uh, everyone here is familiar with the racial equity training that is going on across this country, uh, across this city, and actually across this country because it's popping up so much across this country. And we made a mandate, our mayor made a mandate last fall that every member of his executive team of his cabinet and his commissioners would go through that racial equity so that we could think about how we think through our decisions from a racial equity lens. And I would say that those are some of the innovative practices that I've been a part of over the last 14 years. So uh, I'll just piggyback on what Notoya said. You know, one of the um, initial things that Mayor, Jack Mayor Jackson asked us to do when he took office uh, was to come up with a strategy on how to reduce the city's operating costs by 3% mm -hmm. uh, across the entire continuum. And he said, oh, by the way, you need to do that without reducing services. And so we uh, set into place a process called the Operations Efficiency Task Force. It was done in actually as a public-private partnership mm -hmm. uh, between uh, the city of Cleveland, uh, uh, Cleveland State University, uh, some, a, a number of folks from the private sector, uh, Leadership Cleveland. Uh, I think uh, Mayor Rilo, you actually were consulted. Yeah, no, I and know. You and, three yeah. other, you and three other mayors know, were yeah. actually consulted for mm -hmm. uh, some input from the suburban ring in terms of things they'd like to see done. Uh, and so we created this 400-person public-private partnership uh, with teams for each of the departments to do uh, an exhaustive review of the business practices 
uh, in, that bar in each department and to uh, come up with ways to improve uh, the business delivery process mm -hmm. uh, and to implement or institute a uh, new policy procedure and, in, in, and uh, technology uh, where uh, necessary. Uh, and I, uh, my colleague was being modest when she said what we actually say that actually the first year we reduced operating costs by 16 million, the second year it was 26, and the third year was 29. So in the first three years we reduced operating costs in the city by 71 million dollars. Uh, and you did, we did that uh, obviously through people. That's what uh, innovation in my, in my in my really is about. It's really building two teams of people, uh, groups of people who are creative, who have uh, various discipline, and various skills and competencies that you can bring together mm -hmm. uh, that really want to make a difference uh, in whatever aspect or environment uh, that is that you're uh, working in. And, and you know that that's a high-level human capital side of it. We actually uh, did a spinoff uh, here with Cleveland State University uh, because we were, we were dealing uh, with one of the issues uh, that I heard the mayor talking about, which is development of staff. Uh, and so we created uh, two cohorts of 30 individuals each that went through a, a rigorous training uh, discipline uh, for nine months uh, here at, at CSU. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that came a number of folks who are now department directors, commissioners, assistant commissioners. About 75%. So, so these are things that we, we did out of necessity, not having resources, uh, but figuring out how to partner with resources that are here uh, that had a con common interest and there were all community, that they, had a, they were stakeholders, they had a, they had a uh, a stake in the ability to help to redefine how uh, Cleveland could be re re repositioned to be more successful. Mm -hmm. so. Excellent. Well, Darnell, you mentioned technology, and I want to turn now to Leon Wilson and ask oh. about information technology, smart cities. You know quite a bit about smart cities. And I'm wondering from your perspective, is there opportunities for transformational change and growth using information technology and smart city ideas, or is it hype? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to move because I didn't Please. realize there was a spare chair, and I feel like I'm all the way over Come way. That's not like the Cleveland Foundation to be all the way on the other side. We try to be the convener. <laughs> uh, we appreciate that, too. <laughs> so um, to answer your question, I'm a visual person, so I try to, hopefully my mic is still working. There we go. Yep. I'm a visual person. So imagine the car. And you can probably imagine a time, maybe dating back to maybe around 1970, where when something went wrong with your car, you found out by listening or seeing the smoke come out of the hood hmm. or something, a hiccup or whatever. And then there was this innovation where they had an indicator on there that said, check engine. <laughs> At least it gave you a heads up that something was going awry but you weren't quite sure what was going on. Mm -hmm. You fast forward now, and your car's telling you that the right, right um, tire is a little low, that something else is going on, you're about 100 miles away from, from another um, oil change, All the, and every little thing that's going on with that car now, especially if you have a newer modern car, probably like 2016 and above, is telling you everything that's going on with that car, which door is unlocked, all those sorts of things. Well, how are they doing that? They're doing that through sensors, they're doing that through technology to try to do more predictions about what's transpiring before waiting until the wheels fall off. And when I talk about smart cities, it's that same kind of concept, is looking at um, a hyper-connected city, leveraging technology to discern what's going on in our community, what's going on in that city. It is um, understanding the air quality, understanding what's going on with water, understanding what's going on with, with waste, understanding what's going on with energy, understanding what's going on with other kind of environmental issues. It's leveraging all those, it's plugging sensors throughout the ecosystem. And, and there was a lot of conversation, I think um, Council Matt Jones stole, stole a lot of my talking points where he was talking about infrastructure and all that kind of stuff and connectivity. But it's about, um, it's about having a more hyper-connected city to help inform you what's going to happen and what's transpiring versus dispatching a crew after your residents tell you something happened. Mm -hmm. 
um, that occurred. There's a lot of things that we can do through just diagnosis. It's no different than your physician. If they want to know what's going on in your body, they put a lot of probes on. They try to ascertain what's going on. But now with Fitbits and with other kind of devices that we can wear, we can now inform our physician about our blood pressure, about our heart rate, about other things, so they can be a little bit more astute and say, hey, something's going on. Did you change your food habit? Did you change your diet? Are you walking enough? Are you taking enough walks? So when we talk about smart cities, it is real. Um, but what I will say is that you probably won't find a single smart city in this country. You'll find a smart block. You'll find a smart corridor. You'll find a smart zone. Because throughout this country, a lot of cities are piloting or experimenting, is what I would say, with these kind of concepts, plugging a bunch of center, sit, sensors, maybe in a central business district, or maybe in a high traffic area that, is, that has a lot of restaurants and retail and things of that nature. But I've yet to see um, a full smart city. Mm -hmm. um, that includes San Francisco, that includes Boston, that includes New York. They're doing things. And they're now trying to tease out, OK, how is this helping us operationally? Mm -hmm. How is this helping us to determine whether that we just do a blunt force, brute force attack, and when there's, a lot, when there's a major snowfall, we dispatch all our crews and all our trucks simultaneously to go out to the first, the first tier, second tier, and then artery um, streets? Or do we recognize that snow doesn't fall universally um, at the same rate? And maybe we need to focus our energies on the east side, then come over to the west side, because we can put sensors in the ground. We can put sensors on our street lights mm -hmm. so that it can help us determine depth and depth perception. Or if we're trying to cut all of our parks, if we got 100 parks around growing grass, not all, grow, not all grass grows at the same time. So again, rather than dispatching a bunch of crews out in parks and rec to just cut grass, maybe put sensors in there to determine depth and say, it's time to dispatch a crew over here and not worry about that for a week or two because the way the sun is setting and the way rain is falling, it's not growing as fast. It's leveraging and optimizing the utilization of your, of your precious and limited resources, like the mayor of East Cleveland talked about, so that you can still do proper dispensing of public services, but in a more um, progressive and more um, efficient manner. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about smart cities, it's just plugging in your city, plugging in your city through sensors in order to extract a lot of intelligence about yeah. what's going on so you can then determine how best to respond in a more proactive fashion instead of a reactive fashion. Leon, following up, from a city-to-city -city perspective, what's impeding or what's keeping cities from adopting these smart city, um, these smart city com concepts, these innovations? Well, I mean, there's a number of things, and every city is unique, but in some commonality, cities aren't funded to do research. Cities aren't funded to go out there and say, let's take a million dollars and try something out and see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not held, they're held to a different standard. Um, so how do, you, how do you provide that kind of research? How do you provide those resources, whether it's through federal grant dollars, through pilot, like what happened down in Columbus with the smart um, transit, mobility, tra um, transport, the US Department of Transportation that did that, where they said, well, we want to tackle infant mortality, but we think we can tackle it through a transportation issue, so give us, a, give us some dollars to pilot some things and experiment. Well, how can we do more of that? Because again, from time to time, what I'm hearing through every municipality is that no one's sitting on a boatload of money just waiting to spend it on R&D. They're trying to use those precious dollars to just deliver the services that they still are required to deliver in an equitable fashion. Because as the population may be shrinking, the geography isn't. Right. Um, I come from Detroit, where again, the population shrunk um, significantly, but they still get you know, miles and miles and miles to still cut and, and deal, with, deal with roads. And as much as they try to maybe, you know, basically block off one corridor of a city and turn it into nothing but parks, the, the neighbors, the residents aren't letting them. So, um, so it's just basically, again, so it's realizing providing the cities with the resources, but also um, helping to challenge the cities to, again, think differently about how to go about doing things. There was this quote that I love that uh, former Secretary of State Malin Arbright said, 
where, and I, I sometimes I got to read it because I want to make sure that I'm not mistaken in it. But she, w she went on to say, um, I have it right here. Just bear with me because I got all my notes because I knew I wanted to talk a lot. Here we go. Yeah. So she said, people are talking to governments on 21st century technology. The government hears them using 20th century technology and responds with 19th century ideas. Now, not everybody is like that, but the challenge that she's making is, how are our residents interacting and expecting delivery of services, whether um, the, what we talk about the consumerization of the economy? If I can now get in a package delivered to me in less than a day through Amazon, and where it used to take weeks, if I can ship money overseas and let and get and get the check processed in less than three business days when it used to take two weeks, um, I'm ex my expectations now are like the is, are like instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And how can we now and how can cities kind of respond that way when they're still um, held to a higher level of standard from governance, from accountability? from transparency, from due diligence, from uh, procurement and things of that nature, how can we uncouple those kind of things but still allow the government and the municipalities to do what they need to do but do it in a 21st century manner? So there's a number of different things and you have to look at each city on its own and say what's holding you back? Mm -hmm. Is it the dollars? Is it the public will? Is there other challenges that are going on um, that will that is inhibiting your ability to go out here and experiment, then pilot, and scale um, to really leverage these kind of things. I would argue that in probably another 20 years, we won't be talking about this. No different than we're not talking about electricity, but 100 years ago when we were trying to move from kerosene to electricity to light our, to light our homes, and now it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. At some point in time, this smart city concept is going to become ubiquitous. And it's going to be just the way we live our lives and the way we do things. There is no going back. So if, if I could, uh, yeah. because I, that, that almost sounded like a challenge. So, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, so just, 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 just to respond I mm -hmm. on a couple of things, because I think you're right yeah. uh, in many respects. But I, I think our role really is to kind of create the, uh, uh, the balance between uh, creativity and mm -hmm. discipline uh, between page, patience and a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as an example, in the city of Cleveland, we, we actually just started an initiative now uh, that I consider a, a major technology enhancement, which is uh, to replace all of the LED street, uh, all the street lights in the city yep. of Cleveland with LED street lights, uh, 65,000 street lights. Uh, but, but we went a step further than that, and we actually uh, coupled that with a camera initiative. Mm -hmm. And so the camera initiative will actually uh, be in all of our parks, rec centers, uh, all of our business quarters, uh, all of our major thoroughfares. Uh, and so we will have uh, the ability uh, not only to have improved uh, safety lighting, but the ability to have uh, eyes on the street, if you would, uh, in real time which will be tied into what is being developed as a real-time crime lab for the city of Cleveland. So uh, that's, 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 the, that's one of the things that we do. I, th I think oh, yeah. that your point really is uh, well-founded. Uh, and so the question is, how do we uh, not just do more with less, but be more efficient at what we do? And so I remember years ago, not, not that long ago, uh, I'd say maybe four years ago, uh, when we were doing a snowplow res res response event, uh, how we knew we had covered various parts of the city is we had large maps and people would actually have to color in the map to figure out what yeah. we'd cover. Yeah. Well, we've instituted uh, AVL, Automatic Vehicle Location. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and that's on, on all, of our, yeah. uh, so all of our streets cru uh, cruising now. Uh, actually, it's, it's in our public safety department as well. Mm -hmm. And so what we found out is uh, through that process, not only do we know where we've been, uh, but we know uh, when they went down the street, how much salt they dropped, uh, whether the blade was up or down, how many passes they made on the street. So yep. when Mrs. Jones calls and says, well, they haven't been in my street yet. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we can look at the record and say, no, they were there at 9 o'clock this morning, and they made a pass. They 
uh, haven't got to drop salt yet because we're still fighting the storm. So these are things that we do. We've taken our um, workforce development piece of it and, or, or work order uh, uh, development piece of it and implemented a program called CityWorks, uh, which is a commonly accepted tool in our industry uh, when we put that on our public utilities department uh, and our public works department. So now we're uh, constantly gathering data uh, that tells us where we did resurfacing, where we fixed potholes, where we did water main repairs, uh, where we've done uh, a sewer line or catch basin cleaning, uh, and more importantly, actually, also it, it integrates with our pavement management program. So every time we do work on the street, it automatically updates the condition uh, rating, the PCR rating for that street. So uh, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we found that it's advantageous uh, for us to push the envelope with our staff to have them uh, participate in the creation of these processes so that they own the system. It's, it's good for us to, uh, at the top, to kind of think of some things, mm -hmm. uh, but the innovation really works better if it comes from bottom up and we find that they buy in and they're vested in it. Uh, so so um, I, I think we've had some success in doing that. We're not you know, 100% where we want to be, but we see the value oh, yeah. in using technology and innovation as a tool for and, service delivery. And if I can just add one other thing. I mean, so I was just listening to um, a couple of CIOs, like the CIO from the um, Metro Parks, and how they're using sensors to now um, detect traffic flow and walking patterns mm -hmm. and the air quality for the animals and also to determine basically are they, um, as far as how much parking do they need to set aside without disturbing the residents that live nearby, so they're, ca they're plugging in cameras to capture those kind of things. Um, I know also in Lakewood, you all are also now piloting um, through some, a, re a, fund, a grant that we provided to put um, sensors underneath to start um, looking at um, beneath the ground to determine potholes and water main breaks and things of that nature and kind of doing that deep penetration right. uh, to try to, uh, um, with your public, um, public um, vehicles and so forth to collect that. And also I know the city, you are also getting ready to bid out for things such as um, smart um, metering. That's correct. As well as um, there was one other thing. So there are things that are parking up and it is happening bottom up. There is no mega like in maybe some other cities, a master smart city plan or strategy. Some of this stuff is happening organically and happening from the bottom up. But again, the more that we can do to realize that first and foremost, we got to make sure that we deal with the connectivity because all this stuff is going to be feeding data. Mm. All this stuff is going to be feeding information. All this stuff is going to be going back up in some ether into some database and now you got to analyze share that information across different departments. There is no, it isn't owned by a single department anymore. Um, so that you can um, make better decisions re regarding that. So the more that we can do to make sure that we have a more hyper-connected city, all these other things that we're talking about can then start to begin to happen. Thank you very much. Obed, my colleague. From a research perspective, what, as you assess the research, what trends do you see regarding innovation and local government or government innovation in general? All right, so first of all, I would like to just say that I'm really enjoying this conversation, especially from an academic perspective, seeing that uh, the kind of uh, topics that you, you are discussing and problems and issues that we are discussing over here, uh, those are the exact same black boxes uh, that people in the academia are trying to figure out. Uh, and, and I completely agree with uh, Professor Murray's uh, 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 assertion that we should have these more of these synergies between academia and, um, and the practitioner world. We really need those. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, this, so first, I would take this opportunity to first give you a very short, brief uh, idea around where innovation research is and what we have been finding lately. Uh, and then I'll uh, probably have a few questions for you. I, I don't know, I'm not supposed to be in that role, <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> but but I do have these very pressing questions. But before that, so uh, very briefly, uh, in innovation research, uh, people have been looking at innovation from two perspectives. Uh, one perspective is looking at the organizations themselves. What is their size? What are their resources? 
Um, some of them like to look at it from a management perspective. What is the role of leadership uh, and uh, ethnic, uh, uh, what is the diversity and those kind of things and whether they kind of move uh, through organizational culture that promotes uh, innovation in organizations and cities and towns. Uh, another perspective that we have been seeing uh, lately is also uh, the innovations themselves. So whether the innovations are easy to adopt, whether they build up on something that already exists, uh, whether it is a completely paradigm change or it is uh, just a continuation of previous policies but with new technology. Uh, for example, instead of having a map uh, with pens and drawing, uh, making those colors, we can have a GIS computer sitting there uh, which does that for you, right? So, so, so those are the two different perspectives. Uh, in general, in research, we find that um, organizations that are innovative, that are considered to be innovative, are the ones that are the leaders in the field, right? So these are uh, the adventurous uh, organizations that are high performing organizations and then uh, they can take all these risks. But on the other hand, uh, we are also finding uh, the complete opposite uh, side of innovation which comes from organizations that are underperforming. So these organizations need uh, innovations. They need to do something. They are under tremendous public pressure uh, to perform. Uh, they are under uh, tremendous public pressure to uh, take care of the of the problems and issues that are emerging in their communities uh, and the, the existing structure or the existing resource structure or the existing organizational structures um, or tools are not helping them do that. So those are the two perspectives um, in, you know, in innovation and in specific, I've, I work with Comstack systems uh, that started in New York and we know uh, in policing that New York was going through a very rough phase in the late 80s and mid 90s. Uh, and then they instituted these uh, Comstack policies that I won't go into detail right now. Uh, but that kind of is the, is the area that, well, there has to be some kind of pressure uh, from within the communities or from outside the communities over these public organizations to innovate. So uh, my question or uh, just for the panel, uh, it, with, with Clayton's uh, permission, would be uh, how much are we investing in understanding about the unintended consequences of technology, right? So when we talk about things like uh, facial recognition technology, uh, it comes with a lot of ethical issues, um, unexplored ethical problems. The same goes with, uh, with Comstack systems. We have had these um, racial profiling, stop and frisk policies, mm -hmm. um, uh, data uh, manipulation, cream skimming, uh, and also on the other side, on the management side, how much are we uh, investing in, say, things like data management or the foundations that we need uh, to have be in place to take advantage of those technologies? Uh, uh, I would like to say that, first of all, knowledge is power. So all the knowledge that we can gain from any kind of technology in our city has given us the power to be able to maintain the city of South Euclid, use our resources, uh, you know, I guess to the greatest of our ability. It's also allowed us to leverage uh, other, other funding, such as from the Cleveland Foundation. Um, something that I say to myself is, is why do we think it's okay in Cuyahoga County that East Cleveland has to suffer like this? You know, not in our county. That's what should be said, not in our county. And I feel very passionate about that because I look around and there's other communities that could be sliding. And we went to the Cleveland Foundation and we wrote a grant for a five city survey in which each of the five cities housing stock was um, how, do I, how do I say it? Um, we went to each home, each commercial building, we took a picture, we brought in all the data, and now we are able to look at every single piece of, of property and structure in our five communities, and we can figure out 
if we tear down a house here, what impact will that have? In our city, we're now figuring out actually how many streets will it impact if we put in a, in a park or if we say to Mrs. Jones, here, we're going to sell you this piece of property for $200, add on to your house. That house goes from maybe 100000 to 148000 What is that impact? It looks at our roads. We, we really believe that using technology in any way, especially with any kind of sensors, we're now looking at apps, um, any way that we can get information, we're able to make a better decision mm -hmm. because we have the knowledge to know what our resources and, and what the dollars are. And going back to what Darnell said, I don't know how many of you, you know this, but when I became mayor in 2004, you had to take care of your own water mains in your community. So let's say you're putting money aside and we're not an entitlement community, so we don't get any dollars from the federal government in block grants. We have to compete for it through a county um, portal. I'm saving money to fix some roads or to maybe buy some trucks and a water main breaks and I had to pay $2.5 million. Wake me out. But working with uh, Mayor Jackson and his team and them looking at how could they do things differently and be more efficient, they realized that if they actually own those water mains mm -hmm. that they're required to fix but South Euclid owned, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So with Mayor Jackson and his team, they came together with a program where we now no longer own our water mains. We decided that uh, we have the legislation and now they come in and, and fix our water mains. We do have a competitive uh, grant mm -hmm. program with them um, and it it's, has saved South Euclid millions of dollars that we've been able to invest in other areas. Mm -hmm. And it helps them in working smarter. So for us, you know, any kind of technology in the smart cities, safety wise, but, but knowledge is power in knowing how to move this region further. And when I talk about the Green Neighborhoods Initiative, this is an initiative that we should look at countywide. That's why the county housing um, a plan is so important. That's why Cleveland's so important. So for me, any way that we can get more technology, mm -hmm. and I know the mayors will talk about it, and, and actually partner with nonprofits, uh, the educational community and with our main core city, we win. Mm -hmm. We win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, also related to that, um, using again data, um, and you mentioned roads, uh, and you know, I'm, you know, just 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 knowing and we're mentioning that all of us are interested in investing in our infrastructure, right. cost a lot of money. Uh, and you don't want to waste dollars. And so the ability to coordinate, uh, so of knowing what uh, the water or sewer department is doing in your, in your area, knowing what uh, First Energy or Dominion has in terms of projects that are going on, or the ability to leverage a water main project uh, as part of your uh, yeah. per, uh, participation for a, a, a grant uh, for state, federal, county, uh, is an opportunity for you. So, that, so your, the ability to leverage all those resources, uh, but do it in a way so that you, you, you take the data in terms of uh, using GIS to overlay all these all this infrastructure and understand what the planning is for the next three to five years uh, and how, that, how you can use that to build uh, your infrastructure for your community, uh, but do it in a cost-effective way. It's still expensive, mm -hmm. but you're now leveraging those things uh, in a way that makes sense. We've also put together, when, as we're doing our resurfacing program, which used to be $4.4 million a year, it's $12 million on the way up to 19 a year. And what that means is, yes, we're going to, be, going to be doing a lot more, but that means a lot more streets get resurfaced. So that means we need to know what the break rates are on that particular street or whether or not there's a basement flooding problem there mm -hmm. or whether or not Dominion's coming down the street in two years with their tear pipeline replacement program <laughs> and tear it up. And so, so doing that and having moratorium programs where we say if, if we resurface a street, you can't come in there and touch it for five years. 
So you need to plan with us to make sure that these things uh, are happening. So right. these are things that we do that we've learned, uh, but we use, again, technology and data to inform uh, those decisions and how that gets done. And, and, how, and how, those, how that data is uh, predictive to prioritize and not to, to be punitive. Yes. And so we have to be careful mm -hmm. that when we analyze data that we're doing it in a way that um, has the racial equity lens, that is prioritizing our dollars, that is looking beyond boundaries of ward-based, but really city-based, so that as our city continues to grow, and our cities, all of them, so that they can be better. I mean, um, we have used CityStat. We used CityStat for, what, 10 years? Yeah. We used CityStat for 10 years. And what happens sometimes when you're in those stat type programs, mm. if the data is presented in a way that it becomes punitive yep. to the directors, but you're contingent on them, it's just like the box in an office with the Hershey bars. If you're in the honor system, right, mm -hmm. you, you may not pay 50 cent because you only have 35 in your pocket, <laughs> right? So you, you have to be really careful about that and how you position that so that the interpretation prioritizes. We also use uh, GIS, and we're using that specifically with infant mortality and lead so that we can think about where we prioritize and really invest our dollars as we're also working not only with ourselves but with our partners because we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. I, right before I came here, I was at the lead coalition meeting and we're talking about use of GIS and where those dollars will be invested and not invested in terms of equity of the ward boundary lines, but really targeting those dollars where the problem is based on GIS coding, based on the addresses where we know that those challenges are and how that overlaps specifically with infant mortality, but even more so how it overlaps with health disparities that we all are aware of that have been the same five health disparities that have, been, that have disproportionately impacted communities, uh, low income and communities of color for 25 years since David Thatcher was the Surgeon General. So using GIS and that type of technology really and that data to drive the investments so that we are a healthier, more vibrant community is what we need to do, not to use that data where it's punitive like some profiling does because profiling is very real and we can't sugarcoat that. And so we need to make sure that there's policies in place to uh, identify it one and to redirect it once we see it. And that means that diversity of thought and thinking in the rooms when you recognize it to redirect it because that's just real. And also, how do you communicate it to your residents? Absolutely. And that's critical. So like in our city, we put our road survey up every single year on our website. And we'll even tweet it out or we'll put it on Facebook that it's up there. And you will actually see, I'll look and check right when it's posted on the data that I get, you know, at the end of the month how many residents have gone on and actually looked at it. And they'll see when the curves were fixed last and what this was fixed last and where we're putting our money. So it, it's not just about you know, being able to manage the project uh, and, and the information, the data. I'm with you. It's like, how do you explain to the residents Absolutely. How, how you're actually spending their dollars mm -hmm. and actually giving them you know, the information. We always say to ourselves, are we giving them too much information? <laughs> you know, now you can go on our website and you can see when you're, what, what, where your road's at. You can go on and see what it's rated. You can go on our open checkbook and see how much money we spend for road salt. In That's fact, right. we are the only community in all of Ohio, an open checkbook that posts every single salary so that you could go down and, and actually drill down and see what a police officer costs, what the mayor costs what that clerk, you know, $25,000 clerk is being paid. So for me, it's the data being able to share it, managing it, and making sure it's not going to be abused is really critical mm -hmm. to uh, how to do it. Um, I just want to tie in one of the things that was talked about as far as residents. So when we're talking about 
technology, when we're talking about collecting data and so forth, there is this um, important component of making sure that you do have the community buy-in. Uh, because we say public safety, they hear surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, we say data collection, we, they hear something else. Um, I was um, hanging out in Chicago because they were trying to push out. They have this project called Array of Things where they want to um, put sensors and arrays um, all over the place to collect a lot of air quality information um, to discern quality of life and, and dealing with health equity issues. But how they approach and engage residents was they actually took those sensors. We keep saying the word sensor, but no one knows what it looks like. So they actually took it and they took a team, even people from the university, to actually go into the local housing authority, mm -hmm. in the community center, sit down and say, boom, there's a sensor. Here's what it's going to do. Touch it. Look it. It's not this omnipotent, you know, you know, thing. Here's why we're trying to do it. We want to hear from you. I mean, give us some feedback. So um, citizen engagement, civic engagement, as far as if we're going to leverage these kind of ideas, these kind of concepts, and how do we basically, instead of, again, throwing a camera up top and then people start thinking that it's surveillance and in some, city, in some communities, they'll start taking pot shots at it to, um, it's real, they'll start, I mean, that's what happened. I know when Google drove around in Detroit, people were taking shots at the Google because they were like, why are you taking pictures of my house? Right. <laughs> um, so citizen engagement mm -hmm. to understand the value and so they understand the importance and relevance that it's about public safety, it's about helping them out, it's the informing and this is where the data is going to go. And this is how we will manage so that we won't have the kind of leaks that you will hear from a Facebook or you'll hear from somebody else. Because again, while Facebook can leak out your information and they'll get a blimp on their stock, on their stock value for about a week or two, we're going to lose all kind of you know, public trust if it happens to a city, mm -hmm. if it happens to a government agency. So we have this heightened sense of responsibility about whatever information that we're collecting um, to help us do our job, to help you do your job. Here's how we're managing this information. Here's where, here's how it's accessible. Whether we're talking about open data, public data, versus mm -hmm. what is public but not openly accessible because of um, um, privacy rights and privacy protection and other things of that nature. But it's factoring those kind of concepts in as far as deploying these technologies. There is this citizen engagement, citizen participation component that needs to go with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's huge. That there's a big transparency with us in, in government and um, it's bringing people together. It doesn't matter if it's talking about a bunch of neighbors, asking them what they would like to see in a pocket park. Mm -hmm. You know, Mrs. A, Mrs. B might be like, well, we don't want people next door to us. We don't want to have all this commotion there. The kids are going to be screaming. You have to manage that. But to be able to manage the fact that you're going to register online because now we're working in the first suburbs and the first suburbs is a, a great organization um, and if any of you want to look at it because we don't have the dollars within our within our own uh, means we join together on many projects and we've just done this uh, building uh, code enforcement where we're actually uh, worked on citizen serve and lakewood has been able they were the first one they're actually uh, further along than south euclid but we'll be coming after them because you know how competitive I am, Mike. Uh, <laughs> but we, we now have the, the ability to no longer have to mail all of this information to our landlords to have them register or to get permits. But at the same time, someone says, I don't really know if I want to give, this, give South Euclid that information online. So there's a little bit of hand-holding. Um, and if anything, like you said, blew up, we'd be in trouble. And I think it's in the schools, too. I mean. You know, I was just at the Innovation Fair um, at Greenview. You know, Rockwell was there, Lubrizol was there, all of these big engineering firms were there, and you're looking at fifth and sixth graders with their inventions. And so much was around technology and um, how can we disseminate information. So uh, mm -hmm. there were some sensors there, which was interesting, um, dog, you know, feed your dog sensors and things like that. So you're really seeing a movement there. And, uh, but I do think that you have to have trust, transparency, and um, you know, one last thing. So we have what, e-newsletters, Facebook, um, Instagram, all of these things, but there's still that group of residents mm -hmm. that want it mailed to their houses. Mm -hmm. It's very costly, print, 
postage, but instead of sending it every month, we now do it three times a year. They get a magazine three times a year. I, I brought some here. So we are moving away from that, but we have to be able to manage that, yeah. that skepticism. We have just a few minutes left in the panel. We'd like to open it up. If there's a question or two from the audience, feel free to, to ask. Mr. Murray. I'll take a shot at that. Um, no. I, the capital outlay, as an example, for AVL was, was not overly significant. I think the, uh, the, the, that's the, the return on investment is what you're really looking at. Uh, and so in, in our, as, as far as we're concerned, uh, it's, it's been money well spent because we took our service level agreement as an example that said, uh, if we had a snowstorm, we got six, eight inches of snow uh, over some period of time. Uh, from the time the storm ended to the time we actually got into the residentials, uh, we gave ourselves you know, 48, 72 hours. Uh, and then what we found out as a result of doing the AVL uh, investment and deployment and knowing where the resources needed to, to be deployed and also had, being able to see where everyone had been uh, is that you know we were we were once we completed the the storm within eight hours of of the storm ending we weren't going into the residentials we were finishing residential so we were saving you know 48 hours of time on the road so that's wear and tear that's that's salt that's man hours mm -hmm. so there's a huge return on investment uh, and the, the knowledge you get on how to be more efficient uh, it kind of pointed to the fact that we needed to re, uh, re, revisit how some of the routes uh, started and ended. So we learned a lot from getting that data, uh, and it gives us credibility with the community because now uh, when we say we've done that, we're able to not only visibly show that, uh, but they, can, they see the difference. Uh, the, I, was, I was talking with the mayor uh, after the last major snowstorm, and, and he, he asked me, he said, how, well, how do you think you, well, you did? I said, we did pretty good. You know, we had 12 inches of snow, and the next day we're cleared up. And, and he said, well, what did you think? He said, I, I didn't hear anything in the media. He said, that's a compliment. He said, he said, the, he said the person, that, he said, they had to go all the way to Akron to find somebody to pick on. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so there, are, there are things that you get as a result of, of doing these innovations uh, or you get, uh, you get, you'll get, as someone said, you get an unintended consequence uh, coming out of that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I challenge our folk all of the time. You know, we, our job is to kind of create the vision, and then we have to allow creativity to occur. You know, one of my most creative people is sitting out there in the office, audience, Terrell Cole, you know, who is, who, is, who is my right hand. I remember my recruitment speech for him was very simple. It, it, it was, uh, you know, if the, I, I need somebody who doesn't mind working hard, who wants to learn a lot, and, and you won't get rich, at least you're not supposed to doing this job, uh, but, but what you will gain out of it is you will help a, a masses of people to improve their quality of life. And when you leave here, the, the city of Cleveland will be in a much better position, and you will have had your hands in doing that. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we do professionally. But to your point, um, every time we've invested in technology, we've done our due diligence to make sure, A, that it was a great invest, it was the right investment, right tool for the job, uh, and that we had buy-in from the workforce. This is not just us giving them a tool. No, right. you participate in the selection process, you evaluate the tool, and you give me a recommendation as to which one of those things that we've looked at that you want to implement. So. Um, 
I, we've had nothing but success at this point. Same, same, same with the city of South Euclid. Um, we've really leveraged innovation. In fact, um, using our CDC, our Community Development Corporation, we have gone out and uh, re actually received grants to build on our programs. On top of it, we've removed a lot of costs within our administration. The only event that our city pays for anymore is our Memorial Day Parade, which is about a $5,000 investment. Every single event in our community is ran through our CDC Smart. and a group of residents that raised the money, and um, it's wonderful. They also have taken on all of the programs regarding housing. So now they're the ones Smart. giving the grants, um, for awarding grants for home maintenance, and they're using, they'll take $50,000 of their money, go to the county and, and, and leverage that to get another 50,000. They now this year, with writing a grant to the Cleveland Foundation, we will now have our first executive director where they have um, an, a project manager because we are now going to do the Mayfield Green Project in which th they'll be leveraging their 50,000 with the Cleveland Foundation's 50,000. So what we've really realized is, is that innovation and ideas don't have to cost us money. And the other thing is, is how about the garden club just locally, you know, getting that going. Mm -hmm. They now take care of all the, the welcome signs. They take care of the parking lots. They, they do all of these things. Then you have your recycling committee. Well, what else can they do? Let's talk sustainability. Let's move into what we're doing here. So we really drilled down and in, in using what we could um, with what we had mm -hmm. and then what we could build on. And I have to say it's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> a lot. Working together and putting everybody at the table, we usually get a better product. Yes. We really do. Yeah, I have to and say. I'll, I'll, I'll second that uh, because, again, our resurfacing program was a huge paradigm shift uh, from going just taking the pie and dividing it by 17 I even do uh, that. to going to a model where you're doing yeah. worse first across the city, realizing that there's a difference between sure. there's a difference between equal service and equity mm -hmm. all right and so equity means making sure that mrs jones on 113th street has the same level of service the same enjoyment and quality of life yes. as somebody on the far west side uh, and the way to do that was by changing the model we've done the same thing with our parks program mm -hmm. uh, we just finished a facility assessment for all of our rec centers and so these things don't get ad adopted or, or agreed to without support right. from city council. So I, I and I, I think it's important too for everybody in this room to encourage young people to run for office mm -hmm. or to come in for a, a, a board and commission. Because I think with these new ideas, and, and I think it was Tunisia that talked about it, how do you manage if how do you manage, you know, the legacies or what people envision the past to be, mm -hmm. to bring the full, to bring forward the ideas for the emerging consumers, the young people, or to teach someone like myself, you know, FaceTime and, you know, all that stuff. And, and, and the funny thing was, is my mother, 83 year old mother was on Facebook before I was, you know? So for me, it's like, how do, how do you manage, you know, a mayor that has to go out and put out information or and encouraging young people to come on city council has really helped in my community we have some younger people on um, city council you sometimes have to take a step back and let them figure out what's going on but it seems to work mm -hmm. now you know where maybe it didn't before some of us have been around for a while I, I was elected in 92 on council eight years there, then eight years on the Planning Commission, and now 16 years as mayor, you know, you have to have that time to allow the younger people, and I was the only young person on council at that time, to come in with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Make it their city, make it their region, make it their county, make it their state, and we'll be successful. It's holding them back and not working with, with our city councils that really, I think,
can hurt a community. Yeah. Pastor. Thank you, Mayor Wailo. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Laurel McFarland. I'm the executive director of NASPA, which is the network of schools of public policy affairs and administration. We're the organization of more than 300 graduate schools of public policy and public affairs and administration in the United States and around the world. And I'm happy to say uh, Cleveland State, the Levin School, is a longtime member of NASPA, and it's a real pleasure to, to come over here and, and spend some time with, with you all. Um, I also uh, am really honored and privileged uh, on behalf of NASPA to thank Cy um, for all that he's done for NASPA over the years as, as Roland and others have been reciting all of the activities and accomplishments of Cy. He didn't mention all of his good service uh, in, in NASPA's uh, name, working with other schools and other, other folks in public affairs education, and, and we're very grateful for that. Um, I think that uh, today's panel and, and the topic, as you can see in, in the schedule, uh, about uh, educating future public administrators and city managers um, really comes down to, you know, do we need to rethink the way that schools of public affairs educate the next generation? And for, for all of you folks here in the Cleveland area, you know, I think the question comes down to, does Levin need to change? And uh, if so, how? And I think uh, it, it's really nice that, uh, that Cy is, is the, the subject of, of this event because I think, Cy, your career uh, stands as a challenge to the rest of us here uh, to live up to your high ideals and uh, your demonstrated integrity as both a practitioner and an educator. And so I think, um, how do we take the things that you stand for and carry them into the education of the next generation? And I think uh, all of the folks who've served on the panels earlier this morning have identified uh, some of the challenges facing uh, governance, local governance, facing uh, uh, global uh, challenges. And I think we are going to have the chance on this panel uh, to talk about how we take some of size, ideals, and legacy into educating the next generation. And I think Levin is not alone um, amongst uh, NASPA schools. I think as an urban serving universities, we have a, a number of other uh, schools within NASPA that face that challenge. We also, um, I think uh, Levin's strong record in educating students for local government is very important, along with nonprofit, all the other things you're doing, and uh, Levin's efforts in social equity and inclusion, um, something that a lot of our schools are concerned with. So I'm really uh, happy to have the folks on this panel with me today um, because I think we've come from different places, but we're all friends of Psy, and we're friends of uh, CSU and the Levin School. And uh, I think uh, it, it's kind of fun to sit down with some friends from uh, public affairs education and talk about uh, Sai's legacy and uh, Levin's challenges and how this fits into this larger question of what needs to happen in public affairs education going forward into the future. How do we need to change? And as you see from um, uh, the program, the friends that we, we brought with us today are Jade Berry James from uh, North Carolina State University, uh, David Birdsell from the Mark School at City University of New York, um, Susan Gooden uh, from the Douglas Wilder School of Government at Virginia Commonwealth University, and Brandy Blessett from the University of Cincinnati, and Clayton Wukich from uh, right here at, uh, at Cleveland State. So um, I'm going to just uh, throw out the first question here um, that I think, uh, I think the one I want to start with, because I think there have been so many uh, interesting comments made already, is Sai earlier today talked about uh, the journey from facing down raw discrimination, um, the journey from that to the modern, 
maybe more subtle, maybe more sophisticated, but no less urgent need to address social equity and inclusion. And uh, in, in cities, in local government, uh, in local governance, and around the world. So I want to turn to uh, the panel and maybe start with uh, Brandy about uh, how size uh, comments about facing down raw discrimination and coming into the, the um, more recent uh, discussions of social equity and inclusion. How you? Um, <clears throat> I, I think those comments are, are spot on, um, particularly when we think about the fact that we use coded language to address issues of discrimination. So we'll use the term colorblindness, right? Um, to never really adequately address issues of race. And those conversations need to happen. And so when I think about, um, and, and that was really the thread of a lot of the panel discussions today, was the fact that like racial issues and racial tensions are really important. Um, and we can't continue to educate students without that particular context. And so I think that you know, as a field, as a profession, um, graduating students who are going to go out into the workforce, it becomes critical that they have a knowledge base, they have skills, that they understand uh, not only what discrimination is, but how it perpetuates through our administrative decisions, through our actions, through our institutional policies and practices. Um, all of those things are, are relevant for the conversation. And if we're not going to uh, be honest in our pedagogy and start to address these things, then 50 years later, we're going to continue to have the same conversations. And so now you're actually doing some things, uh, creating some new <coughs> curriculum and, and that's relevant <coughs> to this. So absolutely, hey, let's talk about the next generation. So I'm very excited to start a social justice MPA program at the University of Cincinnati. Um, it's an opportunity where, you know, so on the one hand, it's an honor to, to start this program. But on the other hand, it's frustrating that in 2019, this is the first program that is anchored in social, social justice. And so I have colleagues here who've been doing this work um, for their careers, right? But it's still a marginal topic. And the fact that like our, our focus and intentionality is to one, recognize um, or, or to use a race conscious curriculum to give our students the, an opportunity to, to engage, to realize residents as experts um, and, and to find ways to co-produce and co-create together so that the tension that currently exists in communities, which is you know, a lack of trust, miscommunication, misunderstanding, all of those things um, are addressed through a, a student's matriculation through a program, right? And so the idea is not that they read these things in a textbook and then go and graduate and have no idea how to problem solve, which folks talked about earlier, but like how do we develop those skill sets in our students along the way so when they graduate, uh, they're ready to hit the ground running. And I think that um, that's what we're trying to do in Cincinnati. Now, what do you make of uh, size comments that uh, social equity is becoming a global uh, matter as well? Um, I, I, I think it is. I mean, we are a, a degree program that inter we, we accredit programs internationally. I think it, it is important that you know, we understand the global context. Um, social media has made it so that, um, you know, we, we understand, we see, we experience um, issues in real time. And I think that, you know, for us to be mindful, you think about immigration, you think about Brexit, you think about all of these things, it becomes important that, you know, from a U.S. perspective, we understand it, but what's the implication for our relationships with our, our partners internationally? Um, would anybody else like to talk about the uh, inclusion and social equity aspect before we? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I think that what, what's really important for us in our field, uh, in the field of public administration, public affairs, and public policy is that we practice diversity and inclusion. Um, sometimes that looks differently based on time and space. I think that's what Sai was alluding to, that we talk about equity and inclusion in different language, but the practice is what we see. So we see often, um, just by way of general observation, um, people say that they believe in diversity, right? And then when you look at who's on faculty, who's in the classroom, what are some of the engaged activities, they're not really about diversity, right? So it's that 
public speak, yes, it's a public service value, diversity is, but in practice, what does it look like? Does it mean that you're able to sort of bring that classroom, uh, br bring the worldview into the classroom? Does it mean that you're able to take the classroom into the worldview? Um, a couple years ago, I hosted the Social Equity Leadership Conference, and our main theme was really all about being globally aware but locally responsible, right? So we understand these global issues, but we practice them on a local level. That's very important. I had um, spent the best years of my life in Ohio at the University of Akron, and we worked very closely with Cleveland State University. We shared a PhD program. One of the things that we did, or one of the things that I did as the graduate assistantship coordinator was make sure that all my students, the doctoral students and the master's students, had a graduate assistantship <coughs> that would free them up to work in agencies in the community with local um, community health centers and other educators, right, to address those disparities that we heard talked about earlier today. The fact that they're persistent and consistent in our society, in our constant in our context of public administration is really challenging, right? And so we see the, um, Cy mentioned that language that we used to talk about these disparities that we see in terms of discriminatory outcomes, right? And so now we're looking at, or have been looking at disparity research, right? But the fact of the matter is really that gap, right? Between the haves and the have nots, those who know and those who don't know. And what our goal should be as we think about educating is really narrowing those gaps so that we can make sure that the work of public service is recognized. Susan, you were. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this goes back to sort of um, size point from this morning, but you know, really when you're thinking about social equity and particularly race, it's a nervous area of government. Mm -hmm. And you know, what do we mean by that? You know, there is this, there is a responsibility for government to work in this space, right? Because government is responsible for providing public services and those public services are to be provided to all. But it's a nervous area of government because there is a discomfort there. And why is that discomfort there? Because there is this historical context that intervenes. And so government has a mixed record, right? I mean, there are some things that government has done um, at all levels, federal, state, and, and local, to uh, make our society more equitable. And then there are things that government has done that's been blatantly discriminatory. And so this remains a nervous area of government, and I was very happy on the second panel to hear so many um, city managers talk about how comfortable they are talking about the dis uh, these topics, because I think you we have to get over that nervousness and become more comfortable in order to move the ball forward. And I think, and especially given this panel and the focus today on um, city management, I think the city that is sort of head and shoulders above everyone else in this regard is the city of Seattle. I mean, they've had long had the, their race and social justice initiative, which started in 2004. It's been sustained over now four different mayors. And so there's a real commitment. If you go to their website, one of their goals is to end institutional racism in government. That's a bold statement for a government to make. And so I think um, a lot of the things that the city of Seattle has done to sort of advance and lead racial equity work in this area is important. On the global side, the only thing I would say is that I think there's a direct relationship to the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And a lot of those are to in poverty to, I mean, to really sort of reduce a lot of the inequities that are around in the world, um, because you're absolutely right. These inequities are not just facing the U.S. Um, this is a, a, a fundamental issue um, across the globe. I'd like to pick up exactly where Susan left off and this notion of looking at the SDGs. We've been at NASPA particularly focused on SDG 16. And one of the key principles in SDG 16 is participation, making sure that participation is broad, that is it inclusive, that it considers every category of person living in the jurisdictions that are participating. And of course, 193 nations have signed the SDG. So you couldn't get much more inclusive in terms of a stated intention on the parts of government. I think that we have to be very radically inclusive 
Uh, and I've, I've toyed with different words in front of the word inclusive, whether it's radical, whether it's 360 degree inclusivity. It must include race. Uh, it must include gender. It must include a number of other factors, and I think that's important, including income, including geography. And if we look at the imperatives that were described in the 10 o'clock panel, uh, and I'm pleased that Council Member Zone is still here, uh, I think he said it very well and some of his colleagues too, that we can't govern effectively unless we're involving people in consent in a process of trying to decide what it is that we should do. And if we accept that the notion of institutional logic is to a large extent distributive, who's getting that distribution? Not all programs are ever equally distributive across all of the conditions and circumstances that they address. How do we begin to recognize surface and then begin to counteract some of those inequities? And they do happen on a global scale. And where we're thinking about the kind of contretemps we found in this country under NAFTA, now the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, um, uh, and we can argue a little bit about the policy later, but we probably don't have time for that in this panel. Uh, but a lot of the discontent is precisely over a more equitable distribution of workforce resources uh, and productive flow. Um, so we need to surface these conversations, and we need to do it in these schools. Because if our students don't graduate holding these to be essential goals of their service, it's not going to get done. Clayton, so all these folks are talking about uh, where social equity, inclusion are going, practicing it in the classroom, thinking about social equity on a global level. What's going on at Cleveland State and Levin to try and take sides and, and colleagues' uh, contributions in these areas and go forward into the next, uh, with the next generation of students? At well, I'd like to say that, that one thing that drew me to the Levin College and to this institution was its focus on social equity, social justice as a value. It's part of the mission of the, um, of the college and the institution. Um, my observation over the last two years here, my first two years at the institution, is that we have, I think, some, some very committed faculty that are working to have these conversations and to try to develop um, in our students, whether at the undergraduate level, the graduate level, the skill of facilitating those conversations, to have those conversations, not shying away from the topic. So um, kind of scaling up, we're having those conversations in the classroom as part of our curriculum. We're having those conversations within the college, students, faculty, staff, et cetera, as part of the college, and then scaling out into the community. And so from the minute that a student enters either the undergraduate program or one of the graduate programs, they are having those conversations, learning how to engage the community, very important skill set that ICMA lays out clearly. Um, but to do that and to, to do it in a way that addresses social equity kind of throughout the curriculum from one class to the other, one program, to another so students leave here with that ability to, to have that, to, to develop that skill. Excellent. Um, well, I think uh, one of my favorite topics in the whole wide world is um, learning, is teaching and learning, and uh, working with all of our schools to really um, be relevant and, and bring and make, to make the teaching and learning that goes on in all of our schools as effective, um, high impact as possible in preparing these young people to go be professionals in public service. And um, I, I appreciated a lot of the comments that Sai and, and colleagues have made uh, along the way. And uh, Sai spoke particularly to the importance of practitioners in the classroom. And I think for me that's uh, very important, but it's also part of a larger effort of bringing the real world into the classroom. And, and I enjoyed the, the back and forth about uh, in the academy or of the academy or who, who's in the academy. Or what. And I, I think part <laughs> of my desire to, is, to, is to like get, get behind, you know, get that out of the way and connect the academy and the university with, uh, with local <laughs> governance, state governance, uh, nonprofit and, and connect those things and to not have distinctions, not have a lot of light between, uh, between what's going on in the classroom and scholarship and what's going on out, out in the real world. So I want to ask uh, our colleagues here about uh, 
building on the, the legacy and contribution of people like Sai, um, talking about the importance of bringing practice and practitioners into the classroom. What, what comments you have about the future of uh, public affairs education in terms of teaching and learning and really uh, in innovation and, and, and so on. Uh, anybody want to jump in first on that? What aspect are you looking at for the, the involvement of practitioner or curricular shifts? Also, just the effort, the hands-on learning effort that is going on in a lot of our schools that I think um, is relevant to size. You know, I'm trying to connect it. Sure. Uh, size comments about bringing the wor real world into the classroom. Well, I, I'd like to share. Um, as you as you know, Laurel, um, a couple years ago, I received the um, Social Justice Curriculum Award for a class that I designed at NC State, and it's our MPA capstone class. For decades, it's fair to say that um, our students, after they finish their education, the core curriculum, they would take a comprehensive exam to demonstrate their competencies or their knowledge base in, in the public service. And so um, trying to get faculty who have been on faculty for decades to do away with that approach, while it might be efficient, it, in my view, is not effective. And so I created an MPA capstone course to do that. And so after students finish their core curriculum, they have to take this capstone class with me. The capstone class is really based on problem solving um, using a group approach. In many of the classes, they are working on their individual skill set, right? But before they leave our program, I think it's really important for them to be able to work together on what I've identified as critical issues in public administration. Some of those critical issues include the Sioux Tribe um, Indian standoff that we had in our country, the Flint water crisis, HB2, which is um, you know, a real challenge with our state government and local government initiatives, uh, just to name a few. And so in those critical issues, they have to problem solve. It's not about a historical account of what happened and what went wrong. It's about um, identifying what exactly is the problem, um, what, what are the strategies that you could do to resolve the, the problem, um, picking a strategy, and then putting that strategy into practice, and then really being reflective about what you did, what you saw, and what, what it meant to you, and identifying you know, how you can evaluate the outcome. And so for several students, they don't have the history or the experience in being reflective. But in the real world, we do. Because everyone adopts a solution, and they rethink it a year or two. And you have sometimes the capacity to make changes or tweaks, right? But students don't reflect back on, well, you could have done things better. Um, as teachers, we do that every semester. We teach a class, and we think, well, next time I'll teach this class, I'll do this differently. And so I want to really help students understand how to problem solve together, and it's really hard. Hard. I mean, uh, it's a, th these problems, you would agree, like the Flint water crisis, I just read an art article yesterday that said five years after Flint, uh, the water is still not safe to drink, right? But people are drinking that water, and people live in that town, and children are being poisoned by that water, and we still have people who are not in jail because of their um, actions and behavior, right? And so the Flint water crisis is an important crisis for us to pay attention to, because so someone needs to solve that problem for Flint, right? And Flint is in the newspaper today, but we have water issues around the country, water that's not safe to drink, water that has unacceptable lead, lead, lead levels, that kind of thing. And we as administrators really know, need to know what to do about these real world problems in the context of public administration. So giving students that opportunity and making it the foundation of their um, education is really important. And so that's what I've done. David. Three things real quickly. First, uh, we believe very strongly in making sure that uh, people are exposed to practitioners in the curriculum. We have 55 full-time faculty members in the Mark School. Six of them are practitioners. Uh, we call them distinguished lecturers. Some universities call them professors <laughs> of practice. Under whatever title, the notion is that somebody has faculty status, is able to vote on curriculum, has the say-so to change the shape of a program, as well as to educate the person, uh, the people immediately in front of him or her in the classroom. Number two, uh, I think it's, a, it's almost malpractice for a school like ours. And remember, uh, the Levin School, the Mark School, we're first professional programs, right? We're not educating people at the master's level in any case, primarily to go into the academy, as Professor Murray observed earlier. We're educating them to go into practice. 
So if we don't give them the opportunity to practice, we're depriving them of the chance really to fully exercise the skills that they're learning. I'm a professor. I love professors. I love research. It's all good. They need to know that. But if they don't need to know, but if they don't get an opportunity to exercise it in practice, they aren't learning all that they need to know. Number three, uh, I think Jade's spot on in trying to help people think about ways to solve problems. I would take it one step further and say that if students actually have, at some point in their career, line responsibility, not for examining a problem over there, but solving a problem right here. It has a particular kind of re resonance. It gives them a particular kind of ownership and something to be proud about and stick on a resume and help get a job while having done enormous good along the way. There are lots of models uh, to make that happen. Be happy to talk about it after the program, but uh, that opportunity can be life changing. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we should be looking for for all of our students and all of our programs. Brandy? <clears throat> well, one of the things that I was attracted to at the University of Cincinnati is that they have a, a research arm called the Cincinnati Project, which is under arts and sciences. And so the Cincinnati Project seeks to um, work with local nonprofits and or government agencies to either through faculty research or community or, excuse me, classroom projects, address an issue. Um, and each year they put on a symposium in the spring to kind of highlight some of that work. And so uh, last year got the opportunity to attend one of the first workshops and um, their focus, so students went out into the community and did oral history projects with uh, black women in the community to one, understand what their experiences were navigating public institutions, navigating transportation, navigating all of these things, and two, created a space where there was an explicit conversation about what the institutional barriers that these women were experiencing as mothers, as um, in, in, all of their, in, in all of their respective identities. And I thought that that was in a, a, a wonderful space to do that in an academic setting. Uh, to David's point, so the students got an opportunity to, to really investigate, work with, communicate with, collaborate with people who are in the city to identify strategies uh, at a local level. Uh, this year's uh, research symposium highlighted work related to, so using geospace, uh, GIS analysis, um, and also a number of different other research strategies looking at eviction. And again, understanding or underscoring the, the impact that black women specifically face being disproportionately affected by eviction, like that research in and of itself resulted in uh, legislation that came out of our city, uh, out of City Hall to help mitigate some of these issues for short-term eviction problems. And so I think that, you know, to be able to be at an institution that recognizes its authority using its resources, be it uh, faculty expertise, but also student engagement, um, to create a space where students are learning, students are engaging, but also being problem solvers in real time, I think is a really good opportunity in thinking about how to use that model to engage our um, MPA students moving forward, I think it is going to be uh, our, our focus. Just to, just to add a few strategies and tactics, um, we adopt a similar capstone model that NC State created, a problem solving model. Tanisha Briley is the co-instructor um, to have our alum come back with that practitioner experience provides a tremendous amount of value in the classroom. Every student as they, as they present their, their final project from the program um, has to present that project to a practitioner panel. And so to graduate from our MPA program, a student has to pass muster with that panel of practitioners. And so that's very valuable. But we also try to instill um, and to expose our students to practitioners um, in different ways throughout their whole experience here, from the day that they set foot, they walk into the door, till the day they graduate and, and go through that, that panel exercise. We do things through a mentoring program where we have staff dedicated, and, and Dean Anglin deserves a, a whole lot of credit for um, dedicating resources to this project, where whether they are mid-career professionals or whether they are um, right out of undergraduate, they have the opportunity, every student here has the opportunity to be matched with a, a mentor from the community. We have, a, a, as demonstrated, we have a, a large network of alums and supporters throughout the region. Students are able to be matched with, with mentors individually. And over my last my two years here, I've seen, I have anecdotes, life-changing experiences and relationships that we've been 
able to offer our students that has, I think, really radically changed the trajectory of their career and their ability to go out and to initiate change, implement change, to get jobs in the communities and do good things just through that program alone. Just, so just a couple of anecdotes to add to the discussion. And one of the things that I think, I certainly agree with the capstone and um, that being an important opportunity. One of the things that we have done, and I think the problem is the scalability, but we have what are called Wilder Fellows and therefore our master's students. And so the students who are going full time to school, they are working 20 hours a week in a, usually a state agency. We're located in Richmond, so usually it's a state agency, but it could be a local government agency. So during, from August to May, they work 20 hours a week right there in a state agency getting experience, getting applied experience. So that's a simultaneous thing that they are taking their classes, they're working in a um, state government office, gleaning that experience so that there's a constant going back and forth between classroom learning and um, learning in the field. And that's one thing that has been very, very popular for our students, not just to expose them to practitioners, um, but to expose them to practitioners in the practitioner's environment, which I think is really important. Um, and so then they're the odd person out as opposed to the practitioner coming and talking to the entire class or whatever, but the student actually sort of being infused in that environment is, is really important. And then the other thing is that um, it's a wonderful learning opportunity for students. Uh, you know, oftentimes they find out, oh, I think I wanted to do, you know, I think I want to do HR. Well, maybe I don't want to really do HR. And so they found that they are able to learn more and figure out, is this the path they want to go in or not? And then the other thing that's been very successful is that um, a lot of those students end up either working full time in the agency once they graduate um, or in an agency that they became connected with via that uh, placement. So it's also getting and retaining talent um, right there um, in, in the public sector, which I think is important. So I think one of the challenges, though, is to be able to sort of have that constant back and forth between practitioners and academics. Um, and to make that available for all of our students, whether they're full-time or part-time. Um, Clayton, before we move on. Just, just, a, quick, up, just a quick add-on. The, the wonderful um, kind of effect of, of having those experiences for the students is that they bring them back into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So it allows, a, it transcends the kind of one-to-many, um, one-way communication where you have a, a professor lecturing to the class. You start to have these, these meaningful conversations about those experiences that they had, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, different opportunities that they've, that they've identified, opportunities that they've identified, and you start to have this conversation that happens in the classroom that is much more meaningful than just a traditional lecture style. One of the offshoots and, and effects of, of giving these students that type of experience. Um, to, to change gears a little bit, I think another um, comment that uh, was made this morning about uh, Cy and uh, his approach uh, to um, public management and public administration is that it was said he, he really cares about individuals. And I think that um, as, I, as I reflect on that and how meaningful the experiences that you all are, are talking about with with capstones and interactions with practitioners and the human touch, one of the challenges that has come out this morning is actually emergent technologies and the dehumanizing potential of all of this and the, the impact that uh, the, some of the emergent technologies can have on the nature of work, on the nature of governance. And, um, you know, and, and the problem that I, I think about a lot that you know, we don't want technology to um, exploit or, or, or bury individual citizens' privacy and, and integrity. And that this seems to me one of the great challenges of educating the next generation. We're educating them for a world where um, there are all kinds of forces that are, are seeking to uh, harm people. And the, for all of the, the wonderful innovations that we talked about earlier, there's also the the risk that if you're concerned about the public good, you're trying to look after uh, citizens and the effect that these harmful byproducts, sometimes sometimes intentional effects of technology on them. 
comments about educating the next generation of public affairs students to deal with this world, that we, for better or for worse, uh, the, the human touch that we celebrated and, and that uh, Cy has sustained over his career is under some pressure and threat from, from this comment. David. This is a huge area in my view, and just one bit of background that Laurel hasn't mentioned. Uh, NASPA is, of course, in part an accrediting body. Uh, we make sure that schools are doing what they advertise they're going to do and that those are reasonably consistent across our 300 plus member programs. Every 10 years, uh, we review the standards under which we accredit programs and we revise those standards. And this is such a year. Uh, so up before the body in the fall will be a set of standard revisions, uh, which may be modest. They're still being drafted. We don't know yet. Uh, but they may be modest. They may be more ambitious. But one of the things that's driving that conversation is exactly this. What do we have to do to accommodate artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, uh, the surveillance state, et cetera, and how is that being driven into our curricula? The short answer to that question is it's not. And that's a real problem for us because we are getting dusted by business schools that are doing this uh, to, to beat the man. Uh, if you look at our counterpart institutions in China, uh, right now the People's Republic has terrific programs in the management of artificial intelligence in the public sector at Tsinghua University, at Xiamen University, at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And do you think that students who are now coming to the United States to learn the best in public administration are going to be coming here if we're not talking about that stuff? Wrong. They're going to be going to Shanghai Jiao Tong and Xiamen and Tsinghua and other institutions. But it's not just about competition. These technologies are coming, whether we like it or not. Do we want to have a role in shaping that? And do we want to prepare our graduates to actually participate in that? They fundamentally displace the, the, the location of human judgment. And let me just take one analogy, if I may, here. I attended a, a, a presentation at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington a couple of months ago. And it was on artificial intelligence in the battlefield. And the scenario that somebody was talking about, and this is all off the record, so I can't tell you who, uh, but somebody in long-time involvement in defense procurement, OK? Um, you have an aircraft carrier group, so it's about, you know, depending on the group, 11 to 21 vessels. Costs about $100 billion. It's extraordinarily expensive. And right now, the best warfighting approach to a carrier group is to attack it with 10,000 or so drones, OK? Um, each one of these drones is capable of firing seven rounds per, uh, per second. So you've got a battlefield scenario where you've got an organized force of independent autonomous vehicles, uh, each with a seven strike per, se per second kill capacity. And so you're firing 70,000 rounds a second. Okay? Are people making those decisions? No. There is nobody who can figure out how to target 10,000 vehicles firing 70,000 rounds collectively per second. So somewhere you've got to bake into the algorithm your decision about what is a crippling blow? What is an already disabled ship? How do you recognize that somebody has surrendered, et cetera, et cetera? Take that same technology, because it will be taken, and put it into a terrorist control situation in an urban park. Okay? At least in the, battlefield, in, in the aircraft carrier group, you know that everybody's a combatant, right? Or at least you're reasonably sure that's true. Um, in the park, not so. Where do you put the human logic? How are we training people to make a decision that a machine may make in two years, in three years, in five years, under stress, not under stress, with adequate financing, without adequate financing, and recognizing that that logic is almost certain to be done by a private company, not written by government, OK? Um, how, where does this live in our MPA curriculum? The answer is pretty much nowhere. There are some shining exceptions at Carnegie Mellon, at Georgia Tech, at USC Price, and a number of other places. I don't mean to leave anybody out. And there may be wonderful things <laughs> happening at the Levin School right here. I will freely confess they're not happening at the Mark School. 
um, although I'm you know, trying to crack enough heads to make that happen, not with 10,000 drones, alas, uh, you know, sometime <laughs> in the next couple of years. But I think this is a huge challenge, and whether or not is it, uh, it is ultimately reflected in our standards, if we're not educating for it, we're educating for the buggy whip, we're not educating for the 21st century that we're going to see in right, right now. Other panelists on emergent technology and helping our students uh, prepare for the next. I think it's fair to say that uh, we ought to have ought to have the conversation around responsible innovation. I, um, as you know, all know, I'm a tired, overworked, poor professor who's also tired. And so I was looking up my presentation from like about a week ago on responsible innovation. The core of it really is in, in four dimensions, you know, res, uh, responsibility. So what do we do with these new technologies that are available to us? Um, how are we responsive to the people who are going to be affected by it or using it? Um, inclusion, right? So how do we include others in the decision-making capability? And then there's one other dimension that I'll speak to a little bit later as soon as I remember. My research in this regard was on um, biotechnology, right? So we're having lunch, and um, I'm sure our lunch is uh, very nutritious for us. Um, it may involve some GMOs. I'm not totally anti-GMO. Um, I think that the technology used to uh, produce food and grow food and split seeds and all that kind of thing is probably safe to eat, right? But I look to government, and I also look to the American Medical Association, I also look to other decision makers, including farmers and scientists who help make the seed or help grow the food, right? But I expect that they also look to the consumer. As a consumer, um, I believe that I have a choice, right? To purchase GMOs or no GMOs. Um, but I also believe that government should look to me to include me in a discussion around whether or not it's safe to eat, right? Because I know what government does is they use the science from farmers and other people who produce the food. So government has not conducted their own scientific evidence to determine food safety, right? But collectively, we're making decisions about the food that's served on our table. So why is this a big deal, you know? Um, I was looking at mistrust, right? Or said another word, another way, credibility. So who do African Americans in particular see as credible sources of evidence, right? Who do they trust to tell them the truth about the risk and benefits of genetically modified foods? Now you might be sitting there thinking, why did she just talk to African Americans? Because when I look at studies around um, genetically modified foods, they only include certain groups of people, white people, Asian people no black people, a few Hispanic people. And part of it is because the scientists or the researchers say that black people are not interested in this discussion around food. They're not interested in biotechnology. We can't get them to participate in our studies kind of thing. And so my response is I can, right? As a black researcher, I can conduct focus groups. I can include them in the conversation around the risk and benefits of genetically modified foods. Because the real question that we need to ask is how do we make inroads into communities that are otherwise marginalized in our society. How do we make sure that African American community members are talking to government about their concerns regarding the risk and benefits? Like, is there an issue around trust in the African American community that sort of informs the way in which we participate in scientific studies, informs the way in which we share our voice, informs the way in which we um, participate in clinical trials. When we look at the, the evidence, right, the evidence is suggesting that some people are underrepresented, some people might be marginalized, some people may not be included, but the framework on responsible in innovation includes inclusion as a driving force. And so I think as researchers, what we have to do is make sure that we include people that we know are marginalized, that we know are not included in the conversation, whose voices have been marginalized and minimized, right? That's being responsible with biotechnology and other dimensions of innovation. The one panelist talked about 
Uh, what happens when you put a sensor in the room, right? Do people feel as though government is spying on them? That government is going to, and, and you know, so when we invest in these sensors in communities, they take shots at them, right? They try and uh, take them out of the community. These are real, real issues that we have to talk about. But this trust or lack of trust is something that we inherited, right? Based on what happened at a governmental level before in different communities. And I think it's something we need to pay attention to. I think rightfully so. So some quick comments from our other panelists about emergent technology and training the next generation. We're starting to run a little short of time, and I want to ask one more question. So. Um, well, I mean, I'll just be brief and say, I mean, I think that one of the things I think we have to think about is always, you know, the trade-offs of um, any technology that um, that we're considering or that we're involved in. I think part of the issue is oftentimes um, we don't do that carefully enough. I think there's either the folks that go on the you know, just sort of pro-technology, this is going to be, you know, this is the bee's knees, this is the solution, versus more the anti, you know, the more traditional, um, you know, that, you know, the world's going to sort of hell in a handbasket and that sort of thing. And I think where the, the sweet spot is, is really looking at both the, the challenges, the strengths and the weaknesses and trying to maximize that for both. Um, because I think then that's where we're going to be able to see us make the greatest strides relative to innovations, but also the greatest strides relative to the human experience. Clayton, last word on this. From an administrator's standpoint, um, certainly there are challenges to instituting curriculum changes and to and to thinking and to think deliberately about you know, how to include these these matters into the curriculum. At Cleveland State, we're part of a collaborative Internet of Things collaborative, multidisciplinary Case Western Reserve University. What we've been able to do is to um, generate some resources from the Cleveland Foundation, which are actually going to help develop a class for public information, information technology. Now, one having one class is just one class that's talking about some of the technical opportunities that exist and the, you know, how we might implement them in, in our day-to-day -day administrating administration of, of local governments. But the next challenge that we have then is to try to address, and this gets to David's point, how do we look at our curriculum and have a deliberative conversation about how to include these ideas into ethics, into organizational, into organizational behavior and performance management in a way that will, I think, adequately prepare that next generation to deal with the challenges that they're going to face. One last intervention, I just wanted to make one comment bouncing off of something that Jade mentioned. I think she's spot on. Uh, and that is that idea of participation and differently distributed mistrust of government and of institutions overall. Uh, and you located that in terms of uh, African Americans and their relationship both to studies and to food information overall. But what group of the United States right now, if we define it racially, ethnically, and by income, is most mistrustful of government? They have the reason to be, but actually the answer is white people, white non-Hispanic people with high school educations or less. Mm -hmm. That is the group in the United States most mistrustful of government. Uh, and that has been a trend since 1965, which was the peak of that group's trust in government. Um, and if you look against any other racial or ethnic grouping with any educational level, that's where it craters. And that, I would argue, is another profound challenge to government. What are the big challenges politically to government's freedom of action right now and to the ability to craft joint acceptable solutions? It's largely that block. So we can either say, gee, you're stupid, and you know, let's try to move on, or we can try to figure out how to engage voters who constitute a very significant fraction, still a fraction, but a very significant fraction of the people who authorize action at the governmental level and among non-governmental partners. And I get back to that notion of radical 360 degree inclusion. If we're not doing it, we're missing even the boat that creates the possibility of getting to another shore. Okay. I do want to make one point. <laughs> I know this is neither a dialogue, well, it's not a debate for sure, no, but among um, biotechnology and food production, among the racial ethnic groups, African Americans mistrust 
um, government the most with respect to genetically modified foods, which make them a prime group to really bring into the discussion around food and food production in our country. Well, and I just want to make one point briefly about American Indians. I mean, one of the issues is that oftentimes American Indians and their voices are not even counted or included in the survey tools. That's right. And so it would be interesting on that study to see if, to, because one of the things, and, and Jade and I talked about this in, when we're looking at research methods, I mean, one of the things that happens is that all those of us have taken research methods, we know, well, you drop a sample size if it's too small. And so in a lot of studies, American Indians are just dropped right off the sample, right? Because the, the N, the numbers are too small. And so what does that mean? That means that we are really telling a segment of people in our community that your opinions are not important because they're not statistically significant. And so we don't care. And so I think we have to really be careful and mindful of the, the language we use um, and the assumptions that we make and even our research methods and statistical tools that we teach our students because in many of those we are just continuing to solidify exclusion mm -hmm. uh, and, and privilege even in something as simple as a sample. Yeah. Well, I think my colleagues have done a really uh, good job of sobering us all about we're sending the next generation of students out into a much lower trust in government environment and that that poses a challenge to live in it poses a challenge to to all of our schools that how do we how do we train students to go out into a world where 80 percent or you know based on all the different surveys show where 80 percent don't trust you a, a challenge indeed. I think the last thing I was going to uh, discuss more at length, and maybe I'll just offer uh, an opportunity for some 30 second uh, <laughs> comments, is on size uh, rich contribution to local government management education with the, the coming reality of in, the intersectoral reality that we are all facing. It's not enough anymore to be preparing students for a narrow area of work uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But, quick comments on the challenge to live in and other schools coming that it's not enough just to, to prepare local government managers. So since you said 30 seconds, I'll be very quick. And to say, I think that one of Sai's um, enduring legacies to the field is that he's really the full package when it comes to public affairs. So he understands in terms of local government careers, in order to be successful, it requires practitioner knowledge, it requires academic knowledge, it requires mentoring, and it requires opportunity. And I think if we, if all of our programs were to embrace that, the Mary philosophy, um, I think we would be preparing and equipping uh, the next generation of public servants in a much better way. I guess I would add to that and just say that um, representation matters, right? And so uh, not everyone has been fortunate enough to have a Cy Murray at, at their disposal, right? <laughs> but his perspective, his experience, his knowledge and expertise has opened. I mean, I've sat here over the last two days and everyone talked about how he opened a door and provided an opportunity for them in a way that um, just doesn't exist in a lot of spaces, right? So not only is it an opportunity, but it's exposure to different ideas, to different modes of thinking, uh, different methodologies. All of those things matter. And so we're talking about educating the next group of public administrators. But you know, to what extent are we, as professors in the front of the room, committed to creating a space that is inclusive, no qualifier, inclusive of all perspective, inclusive of all things and different ideologies, right? And so I think that it becomes very important that if we are trying to prepare people to go out and do work inside legacy, that we are open to this idea that you know representation matters across the board and that we need to be opening doors and creating spaces and opportunities for people to do things in a different way. Uh, we can't do we can't do what we've always done, right? Like we need to be innovative, we need to think about technology, we need to think about these things, but understanding that if we do things the way we've always done, this, these institutional patterns of discrimination, of injustice, of racism will continue. So how do we get outside of that box and begin to challenge those systems with our realm, within our realms of privilege and opportunity? And, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. 
Since we only have 30 seconds, I'm going to echo everything that Brandy just said and let those words stand. They're very good. And just say a word about intersectoral. Uh, it has been 25 years since the majority of city services were delivered by any city government. They've been delivered by nonprofit organizations under contract with city or state governments, right? Um, yet we still have arguments in this field about whether we should be teaching nonprofit, I, which, which strikes me as crazy. Uh, there are now 60% of the programs in NASPA that offer nonprofit concentrations. The extent to which, I mean, it's no better if you only teach nonprofit and you don't teach government. The only thing that I'd add is that we have to be more rigorously uh, cross sectoral uh, because a lot of the stuff that we're looking at right now fundamentally involves the private sector. If you're talking about infrastructure, if you're talking about various financing options, uh, if you're talking about the logics that are built into algorithms, uh, if you're talking about autonomous vehicles, you're talking about working with the private sector to develop public goods. So if you're not spanning all of those sectors, you are not educating your students well. By the way, I'm an avowed optimist on all of these things. We'll figure it out. We just have to get to work. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank my colleagues on the panel for reflecting on size legacy and contribution to public affairs education and the challenges that we face in taking those values and contributions and preparing the next generation at Levin and across the country and around the world. So thank you. Thank you. And then I'll take my 30 seconds. Sure. I love you. For the record, I love the Levin College Dean. Sorry, would you come up, please? <laughs> As you know, I already tweeted this earlier, I've known you since 1995, um, and you've been a big part of my professional life. Mm -hmm. Susan and I had co-authored a book. It's called Why Research Methods Matter, mm -hmm. Essential Skills for Decision Making. Mm -hmm. And we've heard from so many practitioners how important this book is, and so you have the only official signed copy by both of us. And we have to tell you all we love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Not at all. Not at all. My, it's kind of my pleasure. Um, I just want to thank you, Hardy Souls, for staying around. It was a wonderful conversation. Um, I could have asked for more. Hopefully, we'll continue uh, dissect uh, various parts of the challenges of city management going forward. Um, sneaky hint, I want to see a vibrant city management program back here at the college. I think it's absolutely necessary, and uh, I know my colleagues will, will, will make it happen. Um, Sai has asked me to give him the last word, and so <laughs> what Sai wants, I, I get. I really <laughs> wanted to tell him thank you, and to tell all of you thank you and to just mention to some who might question it that the Levin College was very good to me while I was here. It really was. And <clears throat> an example of that might be um, at one time our college chair of the program was leaving for a semester, something like that, and he asked me to be the acting chair of the department. I thought for certain that was the PhD program, but it wasn't. <laughs> he said I was a part of it. So I said, I don't really know. Well, what do you do? And he said, uh, well, you know, if, if issues or problems come up, we can deal with it. You have to deal with it. And I said, like what? And he said, well, if a student has a question about grades with their professor, they bring it to the chair try to resolve. And I said, I'll do it. And sure enough, a, a student came up, came to me, and he had a disagreement with his professor about the uh, grade. I went to the professor and just asked the professor, you know, what is happening. The professor said to me very plainly, I mean, he gave me respect for being the acting chair. And he said, that student was absolutely horrible and disrespectful to me showed me no kind of respect. <clears throat> and I said, and what does that have to do with the grade? Um, did he do the work? He said, it doesn't make any difference. He was disrespectful. I said, no, you know, he, he doesn't have to like you. And I don't mean that you're not likable. 
But if the guy did the work, give him the grade that he earned. And the professor did it and changed the grade. And, and, and I just think that was a big, big thing for him to do just by me asking. And, and I like the university for that problem. And nothing has been said now. Nothing public got out of that. It's just me and the professor. And he eventually changed the grade. And the second instance, some of you may think that I only had black GAs. I had a lot of white GAs, too. And one of my white GAs was with me <clears throat> when it was time to go to one of these conferences that uh, we talk about. <clears throat> and, the, and the little guy said, uh, well, Professor, why are you taking me to a black conference? And in essence, why are you making me go to a black conference? And I said to him, you're going to be a city manager, and you're going to manage black people in your city. So you ought to go. And he said, OK. He went, and he, had, and he learned how to dance black. <laughs> he enjoyed the experience. When he left us, he got an, an internship in Florida with a city that had a large black population, and he wrote me back and told me, thank you for introducing me to black people. I was not scared of those people at all when I had to deal with them. That's the Levin College, and that's what has been good to me. And I just want to say thank you. I know, Dean, that you got a good thing here, and thank you for inviting me to this event and having it. Thank you. Thank you.